society is going through a whole host of problems, including seeing an explosion of obesity. And since that time, in one way or another, the general answer from government, research institutions, organizations has been, hey, this is an energy balance issue. We're taking in too much calories or we're not spending enough energy through exercise. So if we just took in less calories and if we worked out more, then this whole situation would go away. And anybody who's been looking around has seen that that advice has been shared so ubiquitously, but it just hasn't worked. In fact, if anything, we've gone even further down the rabbit hole of more obesity and more metabolic syndrome that's impacted people. And now through partly, you know, your studies that you guys are doing, there's this recognition of, whoa, whoa, maybe the calories in and calories out idea is completely, or at least partly like in a, in, as a main driver is missing the boat when it comes to what actually is making us fat. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for those kind words. So, so when we, we, when we saw that the uric acid could, could have an effect uh, and it wasn't quote through the calorie mechanism, we wanted to actually better understand the role of calories in obesity because of this very controversy that you're talking about. And um, you know, there were people saying, well, um, that especially from the high fructose corn syrup industry, the, the, the people are saying, hey, sugar isn't the cause of obesity. It's the fact that you want second helpings. It's the fact that you're going back for more. Sugar, it, you know, is just uh, an empty calorie. It may not be nutritionally good, but um, it's not causing obesity. It's too many calories, that is. And so we wanted to look at that more carefully. And so the way we did that was to, to try to distinguish caloric or to separate the effects of caloric intake from the effects of sugar. And the first way we did this, and, and actually Taka did this uh, in, in his original papers, what, what, what we did was we took laboratory animals and we fed them sugar, uh, like 40% sugar diet. And or like a 30 percent. But, you know, we, the, the best, you know, I think there was 40 percent sugar versus 40 percent carbohydrate that was not sugar. Um, and, uh, and and actually it was it was like a 60 percent carbohydrate diet, 40 percent sugar, 20 percent carbohydrate, other cause versus 60 percent carbohydrate and the same amount of protein and fat. And then what we did is we fed all the animals the same amount of food. They were not allowed to go back for seconds. So it's very um, controlled. Every animal ate the same amount of food. And what we found was that um, when, when you controlled for food intake, weight gain was, was almost the same between the two groups. It tended to be a little higher in the sugar group, but uh, weight gain itself did not show that much difference but everything else showed great differences. So the sugar fed animals were diabetic and insulin resistant and had fatty liver and, and had high fats in their blood and had high blood pressure. And the control rats that ate starch, they, they did not show that. Um, and so the, the main difference was in uh, weight, the main difference was in metabolic syndrome, but the differences in weight were relatively minor. Um, and the, when we delved into that, here's what we found. What we found was that sugar, and especially fructose, caused animals to become hungry. And the, we actually identified the mechanism, and they became resistant to a hormone that, that makes people feel full. So uh, this hormone called leptin comes from the fat, and it tells us when, we're, when we feel full. Uh, That's what we call satiety response. And... Um, when we gave fructose, they lost that satiety response. They, they lost that sense of feeling full and they became resistant to the effects of leptin. So normally if you inject leptin in an animal, they'll quit eating or they'll reduce their intake. But if you inject a fructose fed animal with leptin, they continue to eat, they continue to eat. And so what happens was when we were, when you give them fructose, um, they, the animals get hungry, they wanna eat more. 
So if there's if it's an ad libitum diet where they can eat all they want, the fructose fed animals will eat more and they will gain fat. And also they'll they they uh, if you give them high fat diet and they're and that with sugar or fructose, they can really gain weight because the high fat diet is energy dense. It's like nine calories a gram whereas uh, carbohydrates and, and protein are four calories a gram. So they eat this one gram of food, they get twice the amount of energy. So if you give an animal uh, with, that is leptin resistant from fructose and you give it a high fat diet, it gains real, a lot of weight because it, weight gain is driven by food, largely by food intake and a little bit less by the drop in energy metabolism. So when you give fructose, energy metabolism falls so that for the same amount of food, they do gain a little weight, but it's relatively small relative to their hunger. So they eat a lot more. So if you on an ad libitum diet where you can eat all you want, a fructose fed animal will gain weight. And especially if you give it a high fat diet with it, it will eat all that and gain a lot of weight. But if you control it, so it can't gain weight by giving all the animals the same amount of calories, it gains a little weight because the energy metabolism is slower. So uh, it doesn't metabolize food as fast. So, you know, the there is a little weight gain, but it's not huge. But all the other effects like uh, fatty liver, diabetes, insulin resistance, they occur independent of the food intake, you know? So actually, Carlos Roncal, uh, my, uh, who's in my lab, did an experiment where he did the pair feeding uh, with uh, sugar versus starch, and um, and what he what he did was uh, you know pair feeding is where you at, you know what you do is you start off by feeding all the animals the same amount of food, but there's usually one animal that doesn't eat as much, and so then you cut, measure how much that animal eats, and the next day every animal eats the same as the animal that eats that ate the least the day before. And what that does is uh, every all the animals end up eating the same amount of food. And that way, because um, it's the, the guy that eats the least, that's what everybody gets. And, uh, and they don't get any more. Well, unfortunately, that one little animal uh, turned out to have cancer. And that's why he didn't want to eat. And, and so, uh, so everybody was basically on a starvation diet. They were eating like about 80% of what they normally eat. But after three months, uh, or maybe it was four months, but it was three or four months later, uh, we sacrificed the laboratory animals and the an animals that were on the sugar diet had all become diabetic. They were all had fatty liver, even on a severe diet restriction. And, um, Around that time, I saw a patient who was um, eating very little, but was eating primarily sugar. And, um, and she actually developed the same syndrome. She developed fatty liver, hypertension, actually uh, went, developed significant enough liver disease that she had to get a, admitted to the hospital. And she was actually a bodybuilder. Um, and she was just, uh, you know, kind of eating sparingly and it was eating the wrong food. And, uh, and so she had, was actually doing the same thing uh, inadvertently. And thankfully, we were able to intervene and help her. Um, but yeah, sugar and so, fructose. So, uh, so a couple of takeaways that I'm, that I'm hearing from that that I think that are, that are really key is that even if the diet is controlled and everyone's eating the same calories in the case of the laboratory animals, and then we'll extrapolate it to human beings, you, you might see a moderate increase in weight gain from the animals that had the sugar, but really all the other markers of, of health that you had mentioned, those were headed in the wrong direction, even though the animal wasn't gaining weight. So same thing, you could have a human being that's eating a diet that's high in fructose, whether that's high fructose corn syrup, but also even fruit juices, which we're going to get into in a second. You know, there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast are like, well, I don't really have a lot of high fructose corn syrup in my diet. Well, do you drink fruit juice? And that could be a little bit problematic, not fruits necessarily, but fruit juice. We'll talk about that in a second. So having, even if you're not gaining weight, you could still develop a whole host of issues like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You know, I had a friend of mine who just texted me the other day and he's a, uh, uh, you know, uh, in his mid uh, early forties, healthy young guy 
who, um, you know, healthy from what somebody would say from the outside, they'd look at him and say, he looks pretty good. He's not overweight, right? Uh, he's got a little bit of muscle. He works out, other things. And he texted me and he said, dude, we got to talk. I just got diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Like I want any kind of resources or doctors that you think I should talk to. Like how the heck is this happening? And he's uh, vegetarian, you know, he he's uh, for religious reasons, other things like that. So in his eyes, he's thinking that he's eating a healthy diet. And how is he ended up with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we'll, we'll, which we'll chat about in a second. So just incredibly uh, profound to see that even if you're eating a diet that's high in sugar, and there's plenty of people that are out there that are, especially with fructose, they're like, look at me, I'm fine. I'm not overweight. I'm not obese. But that doesn't actually mean that you're healthy on the inside when we look at some of the key markers that are there. Absolutely right, Drew. That's absolutely right. In fact, we published on fatty liver and lean subjects. And, uh, and we've uh, found that they often have a high uric acid. And, so, uh, and we know that the uric acid is involved in the, in the mechanism by which fatty liver is developing. Um, and usually there, there is some source of fructose. And um, but it doesn't absolutely have to be fructose because you can um, generate the uric acid other ways as well. But um, but but you're right. Fruit juices is one of the secret uh, causes of fatty liver that's not appreciated. Um, And it's because fruit juice also has fructose, you know, uh, so it's a little bit confusing for people because. you know, when we were studying this, we realized that fructose could cause metabolic syndrome. And uh, so when we started looking at animals, we found that many animals that develop obesity uh, were eating lots of fruit. So like bears um, and other animals, uh, birds, before they migrate they, in the fall, they often are eating a lot of fruit and the fruit contains fructose. And, um, and we could show, you know, I mean, in, in some of these animals that we, you know, we can absolutely uh, demonstrate that the fructose likely has a big role in driving the metabolic syndrome, uh, especially from our laboratory studies. And, and so the question is, you know, we, everyone's taught that fruit's healthy, and yet uh, how is it that animals are using fruit to get obese? Uh, you know, when we're told that we should be having three or four or five servings of natural fruit a day. And, um, and so this was a, a paradox that we had to kind of uh, address. And what we've learned is that, um, that the first thing is that when animals eat fruit to gain weight, they're eating a large numbers of fruit. Like the orangutan will, will go to a tree and eat like 100 fruit or more at one sitting. And the bear will eat like 10,000 grapes <laughs> in one 24-hour period. They can tell by measuring it in the scat. Um, and so they're, they're eating a large amount of ripe fruit. And, and it's interesting that as fruit ripens, the sugar content goes up and a lot of the good things like vitamin C go down. And so the, the fruit tends to, the fruit that animals prefer tends to be ripe, rich in sugar. They eat a lot of it. We, we eat like look, one or two fruit at a time often. Uh, It's usually more tart. It's higher in vitamin C and fiber and uh, all kinds of things that are that are good. So vitamin C actually can neutralize part of the effects of fructose. And so can other things in the fruit like potassium and and uh, uh, things like flavanols, which are substances in fruit and and fiber helps slow the fructose from being absorbed. So um, when we eat natural fruits, also a natural fruit has only like uh, four to eight grams of, sh- of fructose normally. I mean, there's some exceptions, but um, but most when you're fruits, eating it in its whole form. You're talking about yeah, when, it, it's, when it's exactly. Whereas uh, you know, if you drink a soft drink, you can get twenty grams or thirty grams of fructose in one swig. And, you know, one one drink, and so the uh, there's a huge difference in amount, and um, and so. When we eat natural fruits, uh, we're not getting that huge dose of fructose. Now, the exception is when you make fruit juice, because when you do, when you drink fruit juice, oftentimes they'll, they'll remove the fiber. It's multiple fruit and that are that you get the juice from, and so it's a higher amount of sugar. And you tend to drink it, so you drink it fast. 
And a lot of the good things are removed when they're re when they when you juice it because a lot of the good stuff is in the fiber and the and so um, so fruit juice has been associated with obesity in children especially and so the pediatricians have actually recommended limiting the amount of fruit juice to children and it we should limit it to us too because it's a, a large amount of sugar. Uh, that you can drink very rapidly and 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 uh, and and then that can get you into trouble whereas uh, natural fruit has all the good things so i actually we actually did a study where we took people and we put them on a low sugar diet a low high fructose corn syrup low sugar diet where we reduced the fructose in their diet down to, and and one group was also on a low fruit diet and the other group got to eat natural fruits, but they just couldn't eat refined uh, sugars. And we found that both had great benefit. Uh, they had equal benefit on most things. And some, some areas, the, the low fruit, I mean, excuse me, the low sugar, modest amount of fruit was actually better as a diet than the other one. It was probably liked more. And uh, it was associated with, with equivalent or better uh, effects on the metabolic syndrome in this uh, overweight population uh, that we did. So really what I'm hearing from you on the takeaway of that is that fruit can be and, and should be a healthy part of, of, a, of, a, of a, what would be our modern, well-balanced diet, right? As long as we're not drinking our calories. Really, that's right. one of the biggest takeaways that I've gotten from your work, whether that comes in the form of sodas or other things, but also in the form of natural uh, sugars that contain high amounts of fructose, like fruit juices or fruit smoothies. It's amazing that even many people that are my friends, again, well-intentioned, are making these incredible smoothies each morning where they put a lot of great stuff in and they might throw in a, a, a enough fruit or coconut water or fruit juices that if you look at the sugar content and the fructose content of this smoothie that they're having, it rivals many sodas that are out yeah. there. And when they wear a continuous glucose monitor, they see as big a spike, if not a bigger spike on that smoothie that's loaded with fructose than they would on drinking like a bottle of Coca-Cola. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, fruit juice, I mean, like apple juice is probably the same sugar content as a soft drink. Um, and, um, so there's a huge amount of, sh of fructose in fruit juice um, and also dried fruit. You know, dried fruit also um, is a lot of it is sugar. We love dried fruit. I mean, who doesn't like, you know, dried fruit? It tastes so good. But um, the trouble is it's it's uh, a lot of it is fructose and a lot of the good things have been removed. So I don't re uh, recommend that either. And likewise, if you're going to eat natural fruit, natural fruit's wonderful. I recommend it, especially like if you're hungry or if you have a craving for something sweet, a natural fruit is perfect. But if you, um, if you like get a bowl of, a whole bowl of grapes and you eat them watching TV, uh, that's not going to be good because if you, if you eat a large amount of, a very large amount of fruit, um, it's going to catch up with you. And I've had patients who've had trouble losing weight, and it turns out that they're doing fruit smoothies or um, or they have these bowls of large amounts of fruit. Now, uh, it, you know, there are different kinds of fruits. So some fruits are, are, are healthier than others. And the berries, for example, strawberries, blueberries, have uh, very little fruit and a lot of, I mean, of fructose relative to all these other good things that they carry. And so um, like a bowl of berries is, is probably very healthy, whereas a bowl of grapes, which are, are, are more sugary um, and have a higher fructose content, it would, it would probably not be good. But I, I do go through that in my book. I have tables showing which fruits are, are safer than others and, and so forth. Yeah. And we have a link to the book in the show notes. And, and we're also going to have you back for a round two, where we're going to go deeper into a lot of audience questions and other things. But for right now, we're going to go through some of the questions that I've put together. And there's one question that I have on this topic of fruit. As I became more aware of the world of metabolic health, my business partner, uh, you'll be on his podcast soon, Dr. Mark Hyman. He wrote one of the flagship books in this category. Um, and uh, I started to realize that, okay, great. It's about personalizing your diet appropriately to, to you. And I started to measure out 
how much is too much sugar? How much is not enough sugar? How do you get the benefits of a lot of the flavonoids and phytochemicals that come along with uh, fruit? But how do you make sure that you're not having so much that it, it's out of control and it, it uh, you know, it elevates your average level of blood glucose and then through reading your work has downstream effects and raises your uric acid. So I want to ask you about the examples that you shared earlier. I was on a hike one time up at Glacier National Park uh, in um, right on the border of, uh, you know, the U S and Canada up in Mon Montana. And um, the, the guide that I had that was working with us, she was like, you know what, I'm going to take you on this really cool hike we're going to take a little edible hike. I'm going to take you down and I'm going to show you all these different berries and other things that we can eat. And I'm really big into that. Anytime I can get wild foods, I'm really all about that. So she took me around this corner and um, she was like, you know what? And it was right before the winter season. They were just about to close the park. All the snow was about to come. Say, so I made it in right before then. And she took us around this corner in this bend and all the uh, berry trees had been completely uh, <laughs> yeah. decimated. And I know I where like, you're going. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, there's, there's no more berries left. What happened? <laughs> She's like, it's, it's actually the bears. We have to be very careful because this time of year, the bears will come. And this was probably one bear that had eaten like multiple trees <laughs> and bushes. And it was a large amount of berries that they would have had at the time. And that's when it really hit home for me, even though I knew a lot of this information that, wow, these animals are stocking up on all this fruit, fructose, to put on belly fat because they're about to go into hibernation right before the winter season comes up. Now, I want to ask you, based on your research and the work that's out there, and you gave the example of the orangutan going and eating a ton of fruit at one time right. or the bear eating that. Do a lot of animals have access to and do they eat a lot of fruit throughout the year? Are they only doing it right before hibernation when it's summertime and it's a warmer climate? Are they eating the same amount of fruit? What have you seen out there? Yeah, so it depends on the animal. So um, so like the bear uh, will typically uh, eat the fruit in the fall. And in fact, the first there's studies that show that the first frost leads to the fruit sweetening a little bit. And so they'll often go out right after that. I do have to tell you, I went to Glacier National Park myself 30 years ago and I was hiking <laughs> probably not far from you. And I ran into a grizzly bear oh my gosh. And, and had to get out of there as fast as possible. Wow. But anyway, <laughs> I'm glad you made it. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> so am I. But anyway, the. Um, but like, for example, uh, uh, there's a fish called the Paku fish. It lives in the Amazon and uh, it waits, you know, so in the Amazon, there's there's uh, yearly floods. And when the uh, Amazon floods, the river basically spreads out into the into the jungle and it becomes like this huge, almost like a lake that goes out and out for kilometers. And so what happens is the fruit trees get um are become part of the you know they 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 it's inundated from the from the river and the fish will swim under these fruit trees and they wait and the and the timing of the floods are associated with the timing when the fruit ripens and falls into the water and these fish will actually they kind of look like toothless piranhas and they they will they love fruit and they will eat the fruit and they'll eat huge amounts and then they increase their fat, especially in their liver and elsewhere. And then they will not eat for like six months as the Amazon regresses uh, back to its, the river. It doesn't it doesn't really like the, the food, the other kinds of food, and it will just live off its fat. And likewise, those orangutans, when they find those uh, the fruit season and they eat all those fruit, they actually, there's studies that show that they be, they gain weight, they become fat, they've activated this switch. We can talk about how the switch works soon, um, and and they basically gain this fat, and then they again through much of the rest of the year, um, they they don't get a lot of calories from the from the leaves and stuff that they eat, and they actually uh, are burning their fat during that time. There's a, a lemur in in Madagascar that also does the same thing. It eats a lot of fruit, gains, gains fat, and it actually puts the fat in its tail. So it's called the fat tail lemur. And, and that lemur then will hibernate, but it's in, the, it's in the warm weather. 
So it's, it's got a different name. It's called estivation, but it's really the same thing as hibernation. And during that time, they'll, it'll be living off the fat. One of the things um, that's really interesting about this is that the fat provides not just calories, but the fat, when it's broken down, actually produces water. So it turns out that we that when they when they make this fat, like the lemur, it's actually breaking down the fat to provide it water through the dry season. So it tends to it will actually uh, use the fat not just for calories but for water, the, uh, because while it's uh, estivating or hibernating, uh, it needs both water and and calories. And, and the same thing's true for the bear. While it's hibernating and it's breaking down that fat, it's actually using the water that's coming from the fat breakdown to also give it water. So it turns out that fat is uh, is a survival mechanism, but it's not just providing calories. It's also providing water, and these animals use it. But you 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 raised a very interesting question because, uh, and it was the one that we were thinking about, which is you know not all animals are eating fruit, uh, and so how do other animals gain fat? You know, how does the camel get its fat, and how do uh, you know other animals like squirrels and so forth are that may not eat so much uh, fruit? How do they gain fat? And what about us? Not everyone's eating sugar. And yet we're getting fat. And um, and so uh, this was kind of one of our big breakthroughs, uh, Drew, was that we we discovered that um, that people get fructose not just from the sugar we eat, but that our bodies can make fructose. This was a, a big breakthrough. Um, and we've identified a number of ways that our body makes fructose. And we can actually show that when that happens, that the fructose actually can drive obesity. And it turns out that um, this is the way um, high glycemic carbs actually cause obesity. And, and I don't know if you want me to go into that story, but... Um, Please, no, go into it. I think <laughs> our audience is like listening, like sitting on their yeah. head, like, whoa, yeah. okay, let's go into it. Okay, well, you know, so when, when this... Um, when we, when we discovered that fructose could really cause the metabolic syndrome, and it was like really major league, I, I thought that maybe we could cure obesity just by cutting out fructose. And I was wondering if, um, you know, the low carb diet was beneficial mainly because it reduced fructose, not because it reduced potatoes and, and rice and so forth that um, are filled with starch, but not sugar. And so I was thinking that um, that obesity was was really from sugar and from fructose. And I was on a I, I got interviewed by Jimmy Moore, and uh, he told me how how he had to actually restrict all carbs to really lose weight. And actually, it became apparent to me, you know, that things like bread and rice and potatoes were fattening, and you know, the insulin hypothesis was, was very strong. And, and that hypothesis is that, well, um, fat really is driven by insulin. And when you become, um, uh, when you eat carbs like uh, potatoes and rice uh, and your glucose levels go up, that that stimulates insulin. And then the insulin puts the fat um, into the fat tissues or, or generates fat in the fat tissues and, and drives obesity. And, uh, and it's, it seemed true, you know, if you could control your blood glucose and get a glucose monitor and keep your glucose levels low, and if you go on a low carb diet, you could really lose weight. And yet, uh, and so people were talking about things like glycemic index, and they say, well, you should eat foods that have a low glycemic index because that uh, will keep your, the glucose levels in your blood low, and that will prevent you from getting obesity. And yet fructose, when you eat it, um, it actually doesn't make blood glucose go up. Fructose levels go up in your blood. Glucose levels do not, at least initially. And, and so um, fructose has a low glycemic index. And yet here I was finding it was like the cause of metabolic syndrome. So uh, it was like a, another paradox. It was another paradox. 
And so um, what we decided to do was to, you know, when we gave animals fructose, especially in their drinking water, they got really, really fat. So we thought to ourselves, well, um, let's do the same thing with glucose. Let's just give them glucose in their drinking water. And this way uh, they're going to stimulate insulin and, um, and let's see if they get fat. And uh, they did get fat. They, they, over the same time, they actually got fat. They got full metabolic syndrome. And, and so uh, it kind of looked like glucose was also causing metabolic syndrome, probably through, um, but it wasn't raising uric acid, it seemed, right? It didn't seem like the uric, the uric acid in the blood wasn't going up. And so the question was, well, you know, how is this happening when you've been, could it be that there are two mechanisms? But then we realized that, uh, you know, the body can make fructose and there's only one way the body makes fructose. It's an enzyme reaction. It's, it's, it's driven by uh, chemical reactions uh, that can occur like in the liver and stuff. And one of the stimulus for making fructose is a high glucose. And when the blood glucose goes up, fructose can be, synthesis can be turned on. And also when, when, when you eat uh, rice or potatoes or, or things like that, the glucose is, is released from the starch in the potato and, uh, and then the, that glucose gets to the liver. So the glucose in the liver goes high and that we know can trigger the reaction to make fructose. And so what we did was uh, we gave glucose to laboratory mice um, and we measured fructose production. And we found that they were making large amounts of fructose in their liver. Maybe one quarter of the glucose they were eating was being converted to fructose on a very high glucose diet. Um, and, and, and the fructose was activating this, this switch in the liver. And we could show the evidence that the switch was being activated and uric acid was being generated, but it was being generated mainly in the liver. There was a little bit going up in the blood, but most of it was in the liver and, um, and it was driving this, uh, this process. So the way we proved that is we gave glucose to animals that could not uh, break down fructose. These were uh, special genetically modified animals where we blocked their ability to metabolize fructose. And when we did that, they ate all the glucose they wanted. And, uh, and when they ate the glucose, insulin levels would go up in, in their blood, but only while they're eating the glucose. And so the insulin levels went up and the animals gained a little bit of fat, but not a lot. And they didn't get insulin resistant and they didn't get fatty liver and they didn't get hypertensive. Uh, you know, I mean, it was really a protective... I mean, the, the animals that couldn't metabolize fructose were pretty safe from the glucose. And so, but, uh, but what we think, you know, I know that Dr. Bickman was, was recently talking to you. And, and I think that we can, can combine and explain both stories this way. Because what happens is when you, if you give glucose to a, an animal, what happens is they generate fructose in their body. And then they become insulin resistant. Remember, that's part of the metabolic uh, syndrome that fructose drives. So insulin levels go up and the insulin blocks, they have insulin resistant. So, so the insulin can't move glucose into the liver or fat or muscle. But it turns out that it's a selective insulin resistance so that the fat cell still responds to the insulin in terms of, of uh, breaking down fat. Insulin causes the, uh, blocks the ability of fat to break down. And so what happens is when the insulin levels go up, it makes the fat tissue unable to burn the fat. And so the fat accumulates over time. So the, the fat still goes up. It's still driven by insulin uh, because insulin is blocking the fat breakdown. Um, but it's actually farther back, the fructose is playing a role. So it's actually not so much that glucose is stimulating insulin, but that glucose is stimulating fructose. The fructose is causing insulin resistance. 
And the high insulin levels are affecting the ability to burn fat. And so the, the story is the same. It's just the explanation is slightly modified. And um, we, we also went ahead and to really prove that this was the mechanism, we fed animals soft drinks. And we, we made a soft drink of, with high fructose corn syrup. And we, we put it in their drinking water. So the animals were, were drinking basically soft drinks around the clock. And they get really, really fat. They get metabolic syndrome. They get all the things we talked about. And the high fructose corn syrup has both glucose and fructose in it, right? It's a mixture. So they're getting glucose and they're getting fructose. But in these animals, we blocked the ability of them. To, we, we, we gave it to animals that could not break down fructose. They have normal metabolism of glucose. Insulin still goes up, all that. But when we did that, we completely blocked obesity, metabolic syndrome, everything in these animals. So it, uh, most of the metabolic syndrome uh, f from carbs is, is because the carbs are raising blood sugar. But it's not, the blood sugar is then triggering fructose and that fructose is then driving the process. So I believe in continuous glucose monitors. I think they're wonderful. I actually have one. Uh, I'm proud of it. I, I, I use it to, to monitor what foods I respond, you know, cause my glucose levels to go up. And I try to keep my glucose levels down because I'm aware that when the glucose levels are high, I start making fructose and that's gonna counter, um, that's gonna, uh, sort of drive me down a path to become fat and uh, insulin resistant, which I don't want. <laughs> After the age of 40, I turned 40 last year, and this was a big wake up call for me. After the age of 40, every decade you lose on average for people who are not strength training right. and not eating adequate amounts of protein, you know, and finding out however you want to find your protein, depending on your dietary preferences, you're losing the, the stats that they were sharing with me. 8% of your muscle mass every decade. And, and you know, we, we have a paper that's in press and where, which uh, we can show that, you know, when animals develop kidney disease or metabolic syndrome, they start to lose muscle mass. And that low energy, that low ATP is actually occurring in the muscle as well as in the liver and all these different places. So the eight, when the energy levels drop, uh, the ability for the cells to to function well goes way down and you start actually losing muscle mass in part. So it's not just you're losing muscle mass because you're not exercising uh, for strength. It's, uh, it's that when the energy levels start to fall inside the cell, you start losing the muscle, period. And if we, you know, genetically manipulate the animals so that they maintain the so that they don't get that ATP depletion, you know, so if we block parts of that pathway, we can maintain muscle mass even in an animal with kidney failure. So even if somebody's strength training, for example, if they might be eating a higher diet in fructose, it could be tougher for them to maintain that muscle mass. Absolutely. That's, there. that's exactly right. Because of the damage that's being done to the mitochondria. Right. right. So there's two, the way to view muscle is there's two factors. One is what's driving the loss of the muscle, sarcopenia is actually an inflammatory condition. Uh, and there's a loss, it's centered around a low ATP level. So when you exercise, you're, you're doing everything you can to help maintain muscle mass, and that's good. And if you exercise in certain ways, uh, you can actually stimulate mitochondrial repair and, and what we call biosynthesis. By, so you can actually stimulate mitochondrial, uh, the mitochondria to to increase the in number, biogenesis. And exercise is fantastic for that, especially endurance exercise like zone two. That's really good for that. So strengthening is great to help with the muscle, but also you want to do uh, zone two exercise to increase the mitochondria uh, to, to generate. It stimulates mitochondrial recovery. Um, and just, just to clarify for people, you know, zone two is typically people would say it's the type of workout, like let's say if you're walking a little bit uphill or something, it's strenuous enough where you can still, it's, it, you can still talk, 
right? But it's it's not too strenuous that you can still talk, but it's strenuous enough that it's a little bit difficult to talk while you're doing it. That is exactly, yeah. And it goes, I'm stealing that from Peter Atia. You've been yeah, on his podcast yeah. before, which is how I first heard about your work. Was his, yeah, uh, it was. It's you. actually uh, that came from Inigo San Milan originally, who uh, is a, a exercise physiologist. He's coached for the Tour de France and everything, and he has found that this is this type of exercise, and this is exactly how he describes it. How you did that? That is the one of the best ways to stimulate the mitochondria to grow. But you also want to do strengthening. You want to do uh, you know some training. Yeah, you definitely want to do both. But um, they both do different things. But the uh, stimulating the mitochondria to grow is really key to helping recover your mitochondria if you've damaged them. Mm. So, so that's a big takeaway here today is that it's, an, it's another reason why probably our ancestors that might be having more fructose in their diet and the top sources obviously were not high fructose corn syrup, sugar sweetened drinks. But they would have eaten a lot of fruit, which again, we've talked about is not as bad of an issue. You know, it's not an issue. Uh, honey also has a little bit of fructose inside of it. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah. so uh, in the past, the main sources of fructose, you know, before sugar was discovered, was honey and fruit. And, uh, and again, I'm going to say that small amounts of that probably are totally fine to, to really get into trouble you have to eat large, large amounts quantities. of fruits or like fruit juices or dried fruit right. large amounts yeah, of dried, dried fruit. fruit that's right right that's so and, our, our, and honey is is uh, you know no one's really done a lot of studies with honey but i am concerned you know that honey is a problem you know um like if you go to saudi arabia or kuwait there's a lot of desserts pastries that are made with honey uh, and honey is often used as a, is 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 almost like used like sugar over there, right? Uh, but on the flip a, side, I mean, if you really look at their total calories, etc., yeah, they're exactly. probably having all the salt. Yeah, they're yes, having all the yes. saturated. And they're getting the carbs. They're getting from the, the carbs with pastry. It. I feel you know David Perlmutter has written an article about honey uh, when he was writing his last book, which was inspired by your work, right? He yeah. basically dedicated it to you. Yes, right? drop and, acid. That's yeah, a great drop book acid on uric all about acid. uric acid. And he wrote a little love letter to honey, right? Talking about the other beneficial reasons. We know that, you know, honey was sought after by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And there seems to be different reasons yeah. that honey could have been a major part of our diet that's there. But again, how... I, no, I, I mean, I agree with you uh, that we don't know. You know, honey has a lot of ingredients besides sugar. Sure. And, it, it, you, you know, in some respects, it might be like natural fruit where it has a lot of really good things in it. That outweigh the, the that negative That outweigh things. the negative. And, and, and I believe that that's why I say, you know, if you want to eat a little honey, for sure, I, I would not say no. But if you eat a ton of honey, it's going to be like eating a ton of fruit, you know, you know. Which, which also was very hard to do in the past, yes, right? If right. you If you look at like the Hadza who regularly yeah. have honey, you see these videos – First of all, it's not always available. Right. And when you go find a beehive, you have to basically get stung, <laughs> yeah. right? There's usually one or two warriors who are like going to go up first, going to grab it, knock it off. Yeah. They're going to get stung. It's like, it's an effort. You're not yeah. just going down to the local right. grocery store no. and getting as much honey as you want. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right? So, and it's also, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of gorge on honey. You don't see a lot of people gorging on honey right. because of the other concentrated calories that are out there. Right. Uh, but anyways, we got onto this topic because we were saying that on the topic of strength training, the connection that I was making is that even if our hunter-gatherer ancestors, wherever we ended up originating from, they had so much movement in their life just out of survival, trying to survive, trying to forage for food, trying to hunt animals and do all the things that they were doing, right? right. That... That strength training, that zone two activity that they were doing, not because it was cool to go to the gym, but right. because it was required for survival. So even if they did have more fructose, you know, during the winter months, or if they did have a lot of honey during certain periods, they're working out so much that it's not an issue for them. Right. Right. And here we are. We have the worst of both worlds. We're not working out. We're way sedentary. The vast majority of people are not doing any kind of strength training, right. and they're definitely not doing any kind of zone two activity that's yeah. there. So just incorporating more activity could be one way of addressing yes. and getting to the root of this. Yeah. So the, the exercise is, you know, probably one of the very best things what we can do to stay healthy as you, and it's not just because 
we want to look better, it's because exercise improves our mitochondria. And, um, and if you can improve the mitochondria and we help repair the mitochondria, you can repair the damage that occurs from eating a lot of sugar and so forth. Totally. So, so it's really important. It's probably the most important. The other one things that can help, there's actually one, uh, that I haven't talked that much about, but, um, vitamin C is also a, a very, very good compound. It's an antioxidant that actually blocks the oxidative stress in the mitochondria that's induced by uric acid. So it actually is sort of a, a counter some of the mechanisms by which fructose causes obesity. Mm. And uh, we, we did a, you know, so humans don't make vitamin C, you know, right. that's why it's a vitamin for us. We have to get vitamin C. And, you know, it was a mystery why humans don't make vitamin C and, um, uh, it turns out that all primates except lemurs um, have a pro, uh, don't make vitamin C. And so the question is, why was that? And it turned out that there was a mutation in vitamin C that occurred in our past uh, around the time of the dinosaur extinction. Mm. And um, during that time, there was- You're talking about mammals specifically. Yeah, well, so the, yeah, you know, the, at the end of the Cretaceous, um, you know, the, the KT transition, I guess it's the Triassic, but it, you know, uh, 66 million years ago, there was a, a terrible like, asteroid impact that led to the extinction of many, many species, including the dinosaurs. And um, the, there were primates that were alive at that time. There were primates that were Early, some of the earliest primates were, were there. And we think that the mutation occurred at that time and might have provided a survival advantage because if you didn't make vitamin C, you would get more oxidative stress from, from fructose. And so it would be a, a survival mechanism. Mm. So we actually uh, did a study where we, uh, we, we knocked out vitamin C in a mouse so that the mouse couldn't make vitamin C. So you had to, give the mouse a little bit of vitamin C or it would become, it would develop scurvy, you know, right. get a, and then what we did is we, we gave them either a low dose of vitamin C or high dose of vitamin C. And so uh, the animals on the high, and then we offered them high fructose corn syrup and both groups drank the same amount of high fructose corn syrup, but the high vitamin C group um, reduced the, the amount of th their hunger probably reduced the leptin resistance, although I, I don't think we measured that. But um, but the animals on the high doses of vi vitamin C gained, became less fat. They were, we could significantly block obesity. And we, we was, and so I think what happened is the vitamin C mutation was also a survival mutation to help us survive a period of time when there wasn't food ver very much available because of this big extinction and there was there wasn't a lot of plants around. Uh, the, you know, the whole world got dark for like several hundred years, and um, and so uh, my my belief is that that mutation was a survival mutation. So another reminder that you know from citrus foods, things like that, whole foods, not orange yeah. juice. If we can get vitamin C right. or potentially a high quality yeah. supplement, yeah, that that could be one of the things that could protect us from the damage. Yeah, there's so there's some actually pretty good data that vitamin C can reduce some of the features of metabolic syndrome, like, uh, like blood pressure, triglycerides. Um, Any suggestions on, you know, dosages? Yeah, or anything I would like that? recommend 500, 500 milligrams twice a day. 500 milligrams twice a day. So a yeah. thousand milligrams a right. day. Right. Yeah. And yeah. there is, you know, because it blocks the mitochondria, uh, oxidative stress, it's going to be a, a very helpful thing. Um, but there is some data, like if you're a super athlete, if you take vitamin, you know, so to stimulate mitochondrial growth, um, like in a, in a really healthy person, you, wa you want to induce a little bit of oxidative stress to the mitochondria, just a little bit, because if you do, it stimulates, the, it gets them going and then they, they make more mitochondria. So it's sort of this ironic thing where if you have a lot of oxidative stress, you kill the mitochondria it's too much, and if you have just a tiny bit, it helps the mitochondria get strong, 
pr- proliferate. That's the idea of uh, hormetic hormesis, right? Like yeah. a hormetic effect, like Goldilocks yeah. approach. So, so like if you have metabolic syndrome and you have high oxidative stress going on in your mitochondria, vitamin C is going to be fantastic for you. But let's say you're a super athlete and you're doing the Tour de France. You may not want to be taking vitamin C to quelch if you have just a little bit of oxidative stress going on those mitochondria because you know then it may prevent the mitochondria from from growing right which is not going to be most people that are listening right. to this podcast are not going to be that super athlete. <laughs> that's right so for generally most people yeah 500 to a thousand milligrams yep, that's of vitamin perfect. C that's a the, day that's perfect yeah. exactly and yeah. i i strongly recommend that um but like if you are a super athlete i probably would not right you're adding in the caveat right yes so now we're going to get into diet right yeah. okay. we've talked a little bit about it first you know salt we've chatted a bunch about just by not consuming highly processed you know rolls breads things that you pick up from the grocery store and you can look on the back and you can see the sodium content that's the vast majority of sodium that we're seeing especially in the industrialized world which right. is now not just america and europe but it's being exported around the world to places like yeah. india yeah. saudi arabia you mentioned etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's going to be the best approach for tackling salt how do you feel within the caveat of is there a threshold or a dosage of, of sodium that you feel induces this? Because what's common these days, or you know, I'm asking myself, is that people who are quite active, you know, I do strength training, you know, yeah. three to four days yeah. a week. I do a lot of uh, sports and activities, yeah. and so I'll have electrolytes that have some salt with them. And I put a little bit of sea salt on my food yeah. when I'm making it at night. I'm not really worried about that. But uh, yeah, is there some level of sodium that I should be, you know, wary of? based on what you've come across. So uh, salt and water kind of- Neutralize be, each other. You, you neutralize each other and should be thought of together. Right. Okay. So uh, we actually did a study where we gave uh, salty soup to people and you can really mask the amount of salt in soup. So we gave a, a pretty good dose that could increase the salt concentration in their blood just by two points. So normal serum sodium is like 135, to 140, 135 to 145. Um, and uh, we, we gave enough s- soup with s- enough salt in the soup to raise the sodium in the blood by just two points. So and they, how many uh, grams or milligrams was this? Do you know? In I was like two to three grams. Okay, so that's quite a bit. Yeah, it was a lot. And what happened is uh, we, we then gave the soup with or without water. So they got they either had to drink a, a fair amount of water or actually a large amount of water. And if and what we did is when when they, we just gave the salty soup, the salt concentration went up in the blood. That's what triggers this switch to make fructose. And we could show evidence of that switch in the blood. And we knew that they and their blood pressure went way up, you know, also a sign. And then at the same time, we the people who ate the exact same amount of salt but drank water with it, their salt concentration didn't go up. Their blood pressure didn't go up. They didn't trigger the switch. Right. So it's all about the mixture. So for example, I, like if you drink a glass of water before a meal and there's a little bit of salt in it, you're probably going to neutralize the effects of the salt. And, and as soon as you get thirsty, if you eat some salty food and you get thirsty, you've already activated the switch you've activated this fructose pathway. As soon as you think you're, as soon as you feel thirsty, it's being activated. So in a way you're saying, if you know you're going to be having more salt in your diet, just drink more water, just drink more water. That's one way. It's yeah. a process yeah. of dilution. Yeah. You're yeah. diluting I mean, if the you amount of salt. are out working in, working out and you're sweating, you need salt, right? Of course. You're, it's an important reason it's why important. a lot of people recommend electrolytes like myself. Yes, I do too. But, but the, the deal is you want to drink water with it if you're starting to get thirsty, it's you're you you know you're you're getting behind. Right now, now there is this thing where people who are running marathons, I, I you only want to drink if you are thirsty to quench that thirst because people who drink uh, who run marathons sometimes can get water intoxicated if they're drinking a lot of water. Right. So um, and so I would not uh you know. I would be careful about drinking a lot of water if you're like doing marathons. Got it. But but in general, for most people, for the vast majority of us, 
we should be drinking more water than we are. We're, the, the data shows that we're, we're not drinking enough. People who are overweight and obese are almost always mild, mildly dehydrated. You can show it by measuring numbers in their urine and, uh, you know, and so forth. You can show that they're slightly dehydrated. Um, there's a recent study from the National Institute of Health that just got published that shows that if you look at the serum sodium, your, your salt concentration in the blood, if it's on the upper end, but still, quote, within the normal range, it increases your risk for dementia, obesity, diabetes, all those things. Wow. Which goes along with our idea that a high salt concentration stimulates fructose. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, and if anybody is just looking for, you know, a, a free resource on this, we wrote a newsletter that's a hydration challenge. Yeah. I've just over the years tried to get more of my friends, you know, interested in drinking more water. Yeah. And I realized that, especially in the morning, when you first wake up and your body's already dehydrated, right? People typically will have a little bit of water and then they'll go immediately to coffee, something right. that's already going to dehydrate them further. Right. Right. And I love coffee just like yeah. the next person. Yeah. I have coffee too. Yeah. So coffee's great, <laughs> but they're already starting off their day dehydrated. And we already know from a lot of different studies, including the one you just mentioned, a, even a 1% drop in, in sort of hydration can have major impacts on focus yeah. and a whole bunch of things. Absolutely. So, so we have a whole little protocol of, you know, electrolytes, or if you don't want to use electrolytes, just even yeah. a little bit of salt at home that you can use with That's lemon fine. water and put into a big, you know, the, my goal is to get people to drink first uh, 12 to 16 ounces of water. Perfect. Right. And then before they jump right away into their first cup of coffee, nurse another 12 or 16 ounces yes. of water that you can have along with your coffee yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's wonderful. I mean, uh, the, what I, my rule was to always drink a glass of water before each meal. Yes. Uh, and to do, do it before the meal. Cause that's that, right. if anything, you drop the serum so, salt concentration a little bit. And then if it's a little bit low and you bring it up to normal, so what? It's not going to trigger anything. I forgot to mention the other big source of salt in people's diets after bread rolls, it's potato chips. Yes, potato, potato chips, chips are, are very addictive very, because it's that salt, that fat, that carbs oh, all together, and you'll get a ton of sodium from yeah, that. They, yeah, this the vin salt and vinegar. Oh my gosh, you know yeah. those chips taste very good. They're addictive. And, I um, can't even start, I, which is why yeah, I no, eat potato I, me chips. too. Yeah, but yeah, uh, but you're exactly right. So like, if you go to a bar and you're going to eat those pretzels, drink a glass of water first. Right drink water, dilute the salt that's and, there. And so I'm not anti-salt. Right. I'm uh, anti-high salt concentrations in the blood. So the trick is to to do the balance of salt and water so that you, you don't want to be thirsty. Yeah, definitely. Great. Let's go to the next category that's there. And just as a little bit of a recap, which is yeah. the big sources of fructose, because this has been a whole conversation around fructose. Right. So dietary fructose from everything that I've gathered, and we chatted a little bit last time, soft drinks number are, one. are number one, right? They're, they're the worst. Next one would be fruit juice would be right up there for Correct. people who have that, right? Absolutely. So fruit juice is a concentrated form of fruit. You're going to get a lot more fruit than you typically could eat in one sitting by yourself. And again, fruit is great, but it comes with the fiber and it comes with the phytonutrients and all these other things that are there. Vitamin C, as you've mentioned. And so let's eat whole fruit. Let's stay away from fruit juice. Yes. And I do recommend fruit, especially, you know, there are differences in the types of fruits. So some fruits are healthier than others. Like kiwi is relatively low in fructose, very high in vitamin C. It's a wonderful fruit. The berries like strawberries, blueberries, they contain a lot of flavanols that counter the effects of fructose. We actually did studies where we gave epicatechin to people, you know, with this, after giving them a soft drink and, you know, you can block some of the effects of fructose with flavanols that are present in berries, you know? Yeah. So like blueberries, they're very healthy strawberries. Um, another, you know, uh, other fruits that I, I like, um, I mean, oranges actually are very high in vitamin C. I like them. They, they do contain some sugar, obviously, if you're, I don't recommend orange juice, but I do. I I do like oranges, and um, yeah, and some fruit like uh, plums and figs. Figs are probably the worst, and I know you probably love figs. Well, I want to contextualize when you're saying the worst, right? Because we probably are not having an epidemic 
of people <laughs> eating a ton of fructose Fig. because they're overeating on figs. Right. Right. But but I will tell you, uh, figs are, are, are have the highest amount of concentrated fructose of any fruit. Yeah. And it's the one that the like the chimpanzees and the orangutans. I mean, there a lot of primates love them because they they use them to store fat. They use sure. them. Figs so, are a precursor to your body ready to store fat. Yes. And in fact, you think that a big, you know, I think you teamed up with, was it National Geographic or who was it that yeah. you guys worked with? And you were theorizing that when we got this adaptation for uric acid, that figs was one of the main that was fruit the sources. Uh, what was the paper that you guys? It's Scientific America. Scientific America. My apologies. My apologies. Um uh, what was the title of that? That's an interesting thing that we should link to if we could pull that out. Yeah, um, the fat gene, I think. It the was fat called. gene, Scientific America. But you, they were theorizing, and you guys were theorizing that in this period of time when we were coming out of uh, an ice age, that figs and our migration of human beings and the development of sort of our uric acid pathway all kind of coincided together. Is that accurate? And that, That's it. And that was part of the way that we were able to survive the winters is we would gorge ourselves on figs store up a bunch of fat and do all the things that you were talking about at the beginning of the podcast. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, again, this was a story where I, I, uh, joined up with an arch, uh, a paleontologist who's a world expert on, you know, the history, you know, the evolution of apes. So I ended up working with P Peter Andrews, who's a world-class, uh, anthropologist who studied the, this uh, period of time in history was in the mid Miocene, and and it was a time when the uh, our ancestors were actually apes at that right. point. They were ancestral apes, and they were the you know the predecessors for not just humans but also for the great apes and so forth. Right. And um, there was a period of time there with where they were going. There was a global cooling, and the apes started to starve and you could show that they were starving during the cooler seasons. So this was the big insight from from Peter Andrews. He said, you know, that, you know, when the global cooling was occurring, it would the areas in Africa were still warm. So the apes that were living in Africa uh, didn't have to change their diet. There was still fruit all year round, but there were apes living in Europe at the time. And in Europe, the it was cooler than the cooler seasons. The, the, the fruit trees started to, uh, th there was a loss of fruit trees, a loss of fruiting during the, w th during the fall and the primates started to have trouble surviving over the, the there winter. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough food. But then fig And the key was the, was the loss of the fig because the fig is the one fruit that tends to fruit, uh, fruit all year round ah. because of the way it, it's germinated by a wasp. and. And so uh, it was the loss of the fig that led to, you know, the seasonal period where the, the cooler, the winter season, there wasn't enough food around. And so the apes started to starve. That was when this mutation occurred in uric acid and that uh, increased our uric acid levels. And we were we able, we even resurrected the gene and did all kinds of studies. But in essence, that we, we found strong evidence that that mutation led to a rise in uric acid and in, increased the ability of us to make fat from even small amounts of uh, smaller amounts of fruit. Right. It's fascinating. It's a great read. I think it's available online that we can link to in the show notes. Yeah. But just to come back to figs, you know, I think, you know, again, people are not eating probably a, a ton of figs right. out there. Thank there are a lot of dried figs and dried fruit. And there is a little bit of a, you know, public service announcement that you want to make is that even if people think that they're eating really healthy, you see often that people, if they're not eating a lot of processed foods, they still may be drinking a lot of processed juice, right? Yeah, or just fruit right. juice or yeah. even juicing at home. And they tend to kind of the older hippie granola movement that was there. There's a lot of trail mix and yeah. that tends to have a lot of dried fruit. And if you are eating a significant amount of dried fruit, that can also be a concentrated source of fructose inside yes. the diet. The vast majority of people, it's not going to be but there are some people right. that should pay I, I attention agree, to that. I agree with you on that. Yeah. So, okay. So don't eat fig newtons every night. Fig newtons every night. Cause then you got the carbs, <laughs> you got this, you got that. I loved them when I was a kid though. Now, anything else that we should pay attention to before I j jump into the topic of saturated fat, because we talked about it last time. Okay. Anything else on 
the fructose uric acid pathway that are the do's and the don'ts that you want to talk about. For our community here that's looking to have the takeaways, there may be a blockbuster yeah, so, Alzheimer's drug that comes out right. that addresses fructose. But in the meantime, if we're trying to limit it in our diet, what else should we, okay. we be paying well, attention so, to? So foods that contain sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So reading the labels, processed foods are your main source. Um, you know, you want to reduce sugar intake. You want to reduce high fructose corn syrup intake. Obviously, you know, eat fewer desserts or try to eat sugar-free desserts or or natural fruit is a good choice. But but try not to uh, to eat a lot of sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And the main problems are power drinks and soft drinks, um, energy drinks that have a lot of sugar. And do you have a feeling about diet soda? Often people, when they're looking to lose weight, they'll switch from traditional soda to diet soda. Yeah. So our group has studied diet drinks in our models and, and the diet drinks tend not to, they do not cause obesity by themselves, okay? Um, they don't activate the switch. They don't generate fructose. The one exception is sorbitol. That's a artificial sugar that's used like in uh, uh, chocolate syrups and Mm. maple syrup i mean uh syrups like for it's for, a sugar alcohol because it's a tall yeah, yeah. sorbitol yeah so it's often using like uh you know uh, like uh syrups for pancakes and stuff like that that sorbitol gets converted to fructose so be very careful about that one got it but in general but in general they they don't right they don't but they do keep you uh addicted to sweets right so it's and that and, could cause a uh, excess eating. Right, it could drive you to have it, and yeah. seek out more calories. It's going to it's going to keep teasing you because you're going to continue to want s sweet foods. Yeah, Di diet soda got a, a really bad rap in the health community, and obviously, it's there's no there's nothing that's ideal about right. diet soda, but there's been a lot of really great people like you know that have talked about that for some individuals who drink you know two to three sodas a day. And in, in Mexico in particular, there's which has the highest consumption of soda around the world, you have the you know, you, you have people that are drinking sometimes up to like a liter a day. Yeah. Right? It, oh, it's it's, it's pretty pervasive in Mexico and there's a big problem with diabetes down oh, there. Yeah. So for those individuals and for a lot of our audience that might be watching this that's just getting started, you know, diet soda can be a stepping stone in the right direction. Absolutely. The health community was worried about it because of changes in the gut microbiome, but that still seems to be a little bit inconclusive. Yeah. We've seen a little bit of that with saccharin, but that's the only one that we've seen it with. And that's the only one that's really been published. When we looked at other artificial sugars, we don't see an induction of insulin resistance. Right. And so again, it's a stepping stone, right. but if you're not eating, having diet soda, we're right. not telling you to start with diet soda. Right. You know, there's plenty of other things that you can be choosing. Like we have tea or you have coffee yeah. or you have X, you know, all sorts of different options that are out there. And I have no affiliation with this company, but there's a company called Olipop. That's like a natural soda alternative. Yeah. And there's one sweetened with Zevia, like, uh, uh, yeah. with stevia, like called Zevia. Yeah. So there's a lot of options that are yeah. out there. Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely better than drinking a real soft drink with high fructose corn syrup. Right. Because that will will activate this switch for sure. Okay, great. So so anyway, so and then you want to watch out for the high glycemic carbs. And there's really four major groups, right? Bread. Yep. I love bread, but bread isn't good for us. You know, if you eat a lot of bread, that blood glucose goes up and then it's stimulating insulin, which isn't good, but it's also stimulating the production of fructose. And that's not good. Right. And and, and rice, especially white rice, potatoes, uh, cereal, you know, chips, uh, you know, I, they're usually potatoes, but but basically potatoes, rice, cereal, and and bread are the the four major types of food that are high in starch. That will raise, that will be used, that you will make fructose from. So. Right, and and would you say, for example, if somebody is strain training and getting a lot more exercise, then generally they can have a little bit more freedom inside of their oh, diet. Yeah. Right, Absolutely. like I right now have rice probably like three times a week yeah, since perfect. I started my training program last right. August, and. 
I feel great and actually helps me improve because I'm not eating a lot of other concentrated right. sources of carbs besides vegetables. Right. I've seen improvements in the gym as well by yeah. having a little bit more rice inside of and having some more carbohydrates, but I'm also quite active as well. Yeah. So, so glucose is a great fuel, right? A lot of, I mean, you, when you're exercising, you need to have s- some glucose around for sure. And, you know, uh, Indigo Samalan, you know, argues that, you know, hydration drinks should include some glucose, but, you know, you don't want to give so much that you're producing fructose. Right. And that's the problem with most people. They just have so high levels of carbohydrates in general right. that, in their diet right. that that's when they, you know, yeah. and, and a good good sign of that is that their fasting insulin is high, usually right. above 10. Right. Right. My fasting insulin is three. I get it measured every month. Month. And I was worried when I started to eat rice, I was like, oh my gosh, is, you know, cause I was at two previously 2.5 and I was like, oh man, I'm going to start, you know, cause there, sometimes there can be a little bit of fear in the wellness world yeah, around course. stuff. There could be fruit phobia, there could be carbohydrate phobia. Right. But again, if you're active, if you're, if you're yeah. generally staying away from processed foods, if you're not drinking Coca-Colas and sodas and other things like that, and you're mostly eating whole foods, yeah. you can get away with eating some of these Absolutely. foods and they can be part of a healthy diet. We shouldn't have phobia around them. Exactly. And, and even mean, with bread, sorry to interrupt you one yeah. more time, is that things like sourdough can be a part oh, of yeah. a healthy diet. Yeah. You know, I, I do these tricks. Uh, like, for example, uh, you know, I have a glucose monitor because I'm very curious which foods make my glucose go up. Right. And, uh, you know, everybody has or maybe slightly different in their sensitivity to certain foods. Sure. Um, and, and I found that uh, sourdough bread and rye bread don't raise my glucose very much. Totally. They have more and, fiber and, inside and, of them. And, they're, and they taste just as good yeah. to me. That's great. Uh, That's an easy And hack. another one is, uh, you know, like uh, if you put like avocado spread over a piece of bread, uh, what it does is it slows the absorption so the glucose doesn't go up as much. Right. And that's the whole idea of these different hacks. Right. And if you translate that, you know, people are going and eating at a restaurant, they serve the bread. Don't skip the bread, but keep it till the end of the meal. Absolutely. Right. That will work. That, that will work. work. And then eat your fat, fiber, yeah. protein. Right. And then enjoy the bread at the end yeah. where it's not going to spike your glucose as much. It, exactly. And there's people like, you know, the glucose goddess, Jesse uh, Inchowski, who has been on this podcast before, who has a bunch of these hacks, you know, that people can follow. Yeah, on. yeah. No, these so are good tricks. White rice, potato, you know, what, what you said white rice, bread. What else was it? Uh, white rice, bread, potatoes, cereals. Right. And we're wanting to minimize them. If you are basing your entire diet around all of those, which a lot of people are, they have cereal in the morning, they have French fries (laughs) from McDonald's or somewhere else, right? right? That's why potatoes are one of the most consumed vegetables. It's not because people are eating a bunch of potatoes, they're eating French fries. Right. And then they have bread that's there. Then they have, you know, these soft drinks that are there. And then often they might have, you know, rice and right. and some meat in the evening. So they're getting all of them and their diet is based around that. That's when you have major problems right. when your diet is based around yeah. these things. And then, you know, we haven't talked about it, but there's some foods that we call umami foods, which, right. and, and some of them will raise uric acid more than others. And if you raise uric acid by umami, you can also activate this pathway. Yes. Uh, and we published it. Um, so the, the the classic are are things like rich shellfish, like uh, or like shrimp, lobster, crab. If you eat a lot of that, you can raise your uric acid and fairly easily. What is a lot? Because there's people here that are you know. Because you also mentioned like shrimp, right? Shrimp. If you eat shrimp every day, even though uh, you you're not eating a lot of other foods, you can get fat from it. Just because because it's going to make you crave and seek out more calories. Well, what it does, it will raise your uric acid, which will, yeah, exactly. But the uric acid then, so it's a little bit complicated, but, you know, fructose generates uric acid. Uric acid can cause this oxidative stress and lower the ATP in the cell. If you eat a lot of foods that raise uric acid that are not sugar, you can still suppress the uh, mitochondria, but the biggest way that uric acid works, interestingly, is it amplifies and stimulates more production of fructose from glucose. So it sort of acts like salt. Um, and we, it turns out that if you're not eating a lot of carbs, the umami is much less dangerous. 
because you got in order to make fructose, you have to have some carbs on right. board. So like if you're on a low carb diet and you're eating a lot of red meat, you're not going to have any problem. Your uric acid may go up, but you're not going to um, probably get any major problems, as much problems from it as as if you had carbs on board. Right. So it's so the, the through line really here is is these umami foods in the context of a high carbohydrate yes, diet. Yes, that's right. So in the South, especially, you know, Louisiana, area, I don't know if barbecue. it's a stereotype, barbecue, shrimp, other stuff. I mean, for most of them, I would say there's probably, if we did a global study or survey of the top consuming, because because you had mackerel on there as well, right. right? If you look at these seafoods that are there in the countries that probably have the highest concentration of consumption of them, not concentration, consumption, there's probably an inverse relationship with the obesity. Right. Because those communities are also not as pervasive on soft drinks yeah, it's and, and carbohydrates. Salt and sugar and right. processed foods. Like the amount of seafood that's being consumed in Japan or China right. or other right. stuff, you know, their obesity rates are like, you know, 3%. Right. Compared to like the 50% that we're 60% that we're dealing with Absolutely here. Absolutely right. So it seems like maybe the more the through line is the carbohydrates, the salts, inside of the diet and just the excess calories right. that people are seeking out because they're having too much fructose. Yeah. It, it seems like a, a high uric acid becomes really a bigger problem when you're, when you're on a lot of carbs. When you're on a lot of carbs. Great. Yeah. Okay. And if you're, if you are on a low carb diet, interestingly, your uric acid levels may go up uh, just from being on a low carb diet because you're eating, now you're eating a high protein. So you, you can bring your uric acid up. Um, but usually it's not a problem. Right. And this is important for people to know because it's so crazy when people get diagnosed with gout. Yeah. And my dad was diagnosed many years ago before we kind of were in this whole world and everything. Yep. And the doctor's telling them, okay, you know, some standard stuff that is true, right? Like avoid, you know, uh, purine type foods, high concentration of yeast. They would yeah. say beer, which yeah. is true. And you found that yeah. through your yeah. work, right? That's, you that's don't want right. to be having a lot of beer that's right. because there's higher purines uh, purine content inside of there because the yeast, and that's going to drive uric yeah. acid production. Yeah. Al along with the alcohol. The along alcohol. with the alcohol yeah. as well. But they didn't talk to him about just the excess carbohydrates or fructose inside right. the diet. They would say, avoid, avoid dried fruit, avoid right. beer, these other stuff, you know, but they're not understanding because they're not on the up and up on the latest research right. in science. So if you do have gout, this is important because there's a lot of things that are going to be a bigger bang for the buck for maybe reducing or significantly lowering in your yeah, diet. Yeah, yeah. Sugar is a big cause. Sugar is a big one. Okay, yeah. let's talk about saturated fat. And I want to talk about it because when your book first came out and there was a lot of people that had you on their podcast, people like myself, I saw a big movement in the plant-based community because they felt that carbohydrates were being demonized for their association and connection with uric acid and things like fructose were being demonized. But then they would post these memes that would say, well, saturated fat also, you know, has this play into this as well. So what are your thoughts about saturated fat and how we should be thinking about it in our, in our diets? Well, that's a really good question. So um, the very first thing is that, um, so the very first thing is that there are data, you know, I was on Simon Hill's uh, podcasts and right. Simon is a big fan big of plant-based plant individual based, right. and has and, a podcast called the Proof. He, he he had a, he and I too. had a lot of discussions because there is some evidence that uh, high saturated fat can also cause fatty liver in particular. Not so much the other things, the other problems, but um, for some reason of the different kinds of fat, saturated fats a little bit more commonly associated with fatty liver. So both sugar and saturated fat seem to be risk factors for, for fatty liver. Uh, sugar and fructose is driving the whole metabolic syndrome, but, right. but, but saturated fats are linked with fatty liver. Um, and, uh, and, you know, some people have also, of course, linked saturated fats with coronary artery disease and, and the use of statins, but that's actually being challenged more and more. Right. And, and so although the, we know that the atherosclerotic plaque has cholesterol in it and, and things like that, it's not so clear that saturated fat really is the primary driver of coronary artery disease. And yes. so that's become a lot more uh, questioned. Contested, questioned. Contested. 
and that we're not looking at the health of our endothelial cells. Right. Because if our endothelial cells in our arteries and, and that thin lining, the endothelial glycation uh, coating, I forgot yeah. the name. My cardiologist was just on the podcast last week talking about this, that when we have damaged endothelial cells, especially in that coating, the plaque is going to be more sticky inside yeah. of it. And the things yeah. that damage it are going to be- Fructose and uric acid do. Fructose. The endothelial glycocalyx, they call it. And right, you endothelial can damage glycocalyx. It. Yeah, you can damage that with fructose and high uric acid. I mean, there's good clinical studies looking at this. Totally. Well. So this really starts to unravel it a little bit more yeah. that saturated fat so, may be playing a role, right, right. And in fatty liver. It's not the main driver that maybe yeah. most people are dealing with. But it does call into question that especially we should be thinking about avoiding concentrated forms of saturated fat in our diet. So do you I, think so? I will so I did do a I did do a study with saturated fat, with butter fat. Yeah. And um and so the study we did is we gave uh butter fat with or without sugar to animals and then we in some of the animals we blocked the fructose metabolism. What we found was that um Saturated fat does cause a low-grade fatty liver. When you mix it with sugar, you get a very severe fatty liver. And if you block the fructose metabolism, the fatty liver is very mild. So I think that it does drive fatty liver, but it, it's not as power. It's not as powerful as the combination of fructose and fat. That combination is really bad. A fructose and saturated fat for fatty liver. But uh, we we have, um, you know, there've been nice, some nice clinical trials uh, where peop where we just reduce fructose and you can improve fatty liver in people. You know, uh, Rob Lustig did a study and uh, I can, you know, I can think of some cases, you know, that I was involved in. My very first, you, you know, when we were just studying fructose, one of the guys in my lab had a son who developed bad fatty liver. He was drinking a lot of soft drinks. We had him cut out the soft drinks. Uh, his mother was an ultrasound technician so she could monitor his fruit fatty liver and it just melted away in a few months. And you know, our lab study suggests that sugar is the primary driver of fatty liver. Right. But I agree, I've been, you know, there's enough data to suggest saturated fat can cause fatty liver in itself, but it's, I think it's mild. And uh, I, I think that what really drives fatty liver is, is, is the sugar, maybe the sugar with the fat, saturated fat, that combination is yeah, bad. Absolutely. Uh, and then, you know, now there's, uh, there's some studies that people are concerned about seed oils, seed which, oils, which are polyunsaturated fats. And could that be driving the metabolic syndrome? And um, there's a gentleman named Chris Kenobi who's put together a very nice argument that the seed oils are very important. But I th personally, I believe that the the rise in seed oils correlates a lot with the rise in sugar, mm -hmm. and you know that what's happening is as we become leptin resistance from the fructose, the seed oils as well as any other type of fat are just a high energy diet, uh, high energy calories. So yes, they probably are driving obesity a little bit, but it's because we're becoming leptin resistant from right. The sugar. And you're generally, you know, people aren't going out of their way to consume a ton of seed oils on their right. own. Exactly. Right? Canola oil, corn oil, right. uh, sunflower oil. Generally, when you have a lot of those in your diet, it's going to be from highly processed foods, which go to the, again, using the precautionary approach in your life, which is that it's probably a good idea to minimize the amount of seed oils that are there because it's generally going to be associated with having highly processed foods in your, in your diet. You know, there's this other really interesting finding, which is that when you uh, give an animal fructose, they become leptin resistant, which I told you. But when you become leptin resistant, you start desiring fatty foods more. This is a, from work that's been done by some investigators in England, that uh, if you alter leptin signaling, if you block leptin, one of the side effects is that you stimulate uh, the liking of fat more. So it's part of the survival switch, right? You, you, you know, if you, if you want to try to gain fat, you want to start liking fat more. 
Mm. And and so when you become leptin resistant, when you're eating fructose, you, not only are you foraging for food, not only are you hungry, but you you start having a particular desire for fatty foods because they contain so many calories. So it's another way to help store the fat. Millions of years later, so many people are suffering on the planet. It's incredibly unfortunate, but it's also crazy to think that that suffering is largely coming from an adaptation that led to what was centrally part of our survival at that time. But because our external circumstances have changed so much through the industrialized movement, industrialized food movement especially, um, that now we kind of are lost in the swamp of just high uric acid levels that are just wreaking havoc on our system. And the other thing that I think is very interesting about that, especially the study that you did with that tribe, I believe you said in South America, um, is that this would also be part of what explains that human beings can accelerate and do well as or or modern day homo sapiens and all the different hunter gatherer tribes that have been on earth and the modern and, and the tribes that are still on earth that are out there, you see some, you see some that do well on a higher fat diet. You see some that do better on a higher carbohydrate diet. And, and it does seem to be from hearing what you just shared that largely is if we're sticking to a whole food diet and not having refined carbohydrates and high amounts of fructose that come from liquid sugars that are there or unnatural amounts of dried fruit or high concentration of fruit in the diet, that human beings can do well on a lot of different diet. But it's the industrialized layer that's placed upon it that will make all of those diets turn into something that doesn't end up working for us. Is that a summary that you think of? Yeah, I think that's right. So um, basically, the, the, there's a story, it's called the thrifty gene hypothesis. And there's a guy named James Neal, who pointed out that, um, that, that obesity and diabetes today may relate in part due to the fact that, there, that when we were in trouble, we developed genes that increase our risk for obesity. Uh, and so we've gotten those genes. And then what happens is then we get exposed to a diet of processed foods and refined carbohydrates and, and all these things which actually activate this pathway further. And so what happens is we've gone into overdrive. So what was originally meant to help us survive, unfortunately, um, is now being in, in overdrive and is causing obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure. And, uh, and a lot of it is, you know, we've learned how to make a junk food and so forth that's so rich in sugars and so rich in salts and so forth that it can get us into trouble. Now, we've talked a lot about as we wind down here, because we have plenty for a part two, there is a few things that I want to make sure we cover that you shared earlier that I think are takeaways uh, within the context of your research and your work and your forthcoming book that again, is in the show notes. And I highly recommend that our audience um, pick it up. And that is that fructose is one pathway that can lead to elevated uric acid levels, but there's also other pathways that are there. I remember watching this documentary on uh, Japanese sumo wrestlers and for them uh, gaining and putting on mass is, is a whole art and science yeah, and it's not actually absolutely. that 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 easy to do and when they were talking about they basically have these dormitories that if you want to become a professional sumo wrestler it's like you have to go to like sumo wrestler school and in addition to training <laughs> you have to eat the diet and a big part of their diet is in addition to the quantity that they're eating in a day they they have a good you know, when I say a bowl, it's probably not a traditional American, you know, bowl. It's a much larger bowl. They'll have multiple servings of rice in a day, sometimes six to eight large, large bowls that are there. In addition to that, I saw something that was really quite interesting is that they drink beer right before they go to bed at night because they have found that having alcohol, especially beer, is something that helps them put on more mass and weight comparatively to the, what, you know, not having that. So tell us, what is it that the sumo wrestlers know about alcohol that we all should learn and, and take <laughs> away in our own life? 
So it turns out that um, when we identified this survival pathway that's initiated by fructose, that there's a, we found that there was this uric acid generation and that the uric acid then triggered a lot of the survival switch. And, uh, when, and so we found that there are a number of foods that make fructose in our body as well as the fructose we eat. So those foods can also cause obesity, but we can also bypass the fructose part, part of the pathway by coming directly in with the uric acid pathway. And the most effective way to do that are to eat um, purine rich foods that uh, are used to generate uric acid and a lot of them are, are what we call umami foods, believe it or not. And although I, you know, a lot of us love umami, if you eat huge amounts of umami, you can actually induce, or large amounts of umami foods, you can induce obesity very easily. And we just had a nice paper in a very good journal on this showing how umami foods can drive obesity. The number one umami food that drives obesity is beer. And the way beer works is it can, first off, alcohol will, will activate this pathway. And when you drink alcohol, it actually generates fructose as well. And that's a whole story in itself we can talk maybe more about next time. But in addition for alcohol stimulating fructose production in the body, beer is particularly fattening because of the brewer's yeast. And the brewer's yeast uh, is an incredible way to raise uric acid. It's like one of the most effective ways. And when you drink beer, uric acid goes up in your blood within, uh, within a couple hours. And that uric acid is activating this pathway. So um, the beer belly, beer is like famous for, you know, causing a beer belly. It sort of raises triglycerides in the blood. It raises blood pressure, causes fatty liver. Beer is another way to activate the switch. And, and actually, beer and, and soft drinks are equivalent in their effects. Uh, sugar is a much rapid way of doing it. It works within minutes in terms of activating the switch. Beer does it, you know, over uh, hours, but they both do the same thing. So this, uh, this idea, if you're a sumo wrestler and you, you want to eat a lot, a lot of food, uh, but with things that can activate the switch, and I can't think of anything better than, uh, you know, rice, sugar, uh, and, and alcohol, and especially beer. These guys know what they're doing. They're experts. <laughs> <laughs> and beer is the biggest one. But obviously, you know, we know that alcohol is not a health food. And a lot of people, as they become more and more aware of alcohol, they start to notice different reasons to severely limit it based on your awareness of, of the research from your sliver of the world when it comes to uric acid, fructose, the whole combination, is there recommendations that you give to people who ask you? I'm sure your friends ask you all the time, like, how much alcohol is okay? How much is not okay? And of course, this is in the context of, you know, there's a whole, there could be family history of addiction. There could be a lot of things where people just really should avoid alcohol completely. And again, alcohol is is a neurotoxin. And so it's not a health food at all. And everybody's trying to figure out, okay, if I don't have a family history of addiction, if I'm not suffering from addiction myself, I want that occasional glass of alcohol here and there that I have socially. What are your recommendations or do you just tell people to steer away from it? Well, uh, you know, when I was originally studying this, I kind of went down the classic route that said that, you know, one drink a day, uh, or even two drinks a day is probably fine. And it was based, especially if it's wine. Uh, hard liquor is obviously, um, especially it's commonly mixed with sugar um, and it's, you know, very concentrated. Um, and, I, you know, I've never really been a, a big fan of the hard liquor and beer I've known for a long time really activates the switch strongly. So I was always kind of hoping that wine would be the acceptable pathway. And so uh, I was, there's some studies that suggest that one glass of red wine uh, does not, you know, may, may actually be the equivalent to no glasses of wine in terms of its effects on health. And two, two glasses of wine sort of neutral as well. But when you get more than two glasses of wine, you're in trouble. What's happened in the last few years has been our discovery that, uh, and it was also by another group, that when you drink alcohol, 
uh, that the alcohol can also be converted to fructose in the body. So it can become another source of sugar. And, um, and we can actually, if we block fructose effects, what happens is it's fairly dramatic. We can block the effects of alcohol to cause fatty liver. So the way alcohol causes liver trouble, it looks to be like it's driven in part by the fructose that alcohol induces. And not only that, it turns out that if you block fructose metabolism, the craving for alcohol is also reduced. So alcohol and sugar turn out to be very, very linked. Um, and they, they converge on, on how they metabolize and they both end up activating this, this very same switch that I'm talking about. So it turns out that um, alcohol probably is another way to activate the switch. And so it's probably better not to drink alcohol uh, than to drink it. But, um, uh, you know, many, you know, if you're going to drink alcohol, I would recommend uh, wine over hard liquor or beer. And I would try to keep it down to one drink, uh, you know, an evening kind of thing. Uh, there's so many people that love uh, wine and, and alcohol. It's, it's a tough one. But um, it, um, sadly, it does uh, activate this switch um, uh, to some extent. So it's not, uh, if you're trying to lose weight, it's probably not an ideal thing to continue while you're trying to lose weight. Yeah. Not to mention its impact on the brain. We've had other right. experts on the podcast before that say, you know, even recommend limiting alcohol to about four ounces a week based right. on their work and research in the space of Alzheimer's. And it's a tough thing, but hey, we want to look at the truth around all yeah, aspects. Exactly. And I think that anybody who is drinking on a regular basis, even if you're at that glass a day and it's super high quality wine, I think it's very important to integrate some aspect of regular alcohol fasting, long, long periods, maybe even a month, you know, a month on, a month off, because we sometimes don't know the full impact that alcohol is having on us. And it's only until we go completely off of it that we notice the, the difference that's there. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, and I, uh, I haven't really studied that, but it, that makes a great deal of sense to me. Let's talk about another category that you hinted at earlier, and that is beef. Why is beef in this category? You know, especially in the explosion of a lot of awareness around grass-fed meats, a lot of folks have talked about grass-fed beef being in the category of, uh, you know, even a potentially like a, a superfood. So what do we know about beef and its role in red meat specifically as the category when it comes to your work and research? Well, um, so red meats can raise uric acid. Um, they're, you know, it's a little bit variable, uh, but they contain purines that um, can be degraded down to uric acid. There are some studies that have linked red meat intake with increased risk for diabetes. It's a little bit of a controversial area. Um, you know, obviously it's not like a high carb diet, um, where, um, where for sure high glycemic carbs increase the risk for diabetes. But um, there are some data suggesting that red meats may not be that health, helpful. helpful. Um, and for example, there's a substance called uh, TMAO, which can be generated from red meat intake that is thought to may potentially have an increased risk for heart disease. Um, so there, you know, I, I'm not really, uh, major league against red meats. Um, I, you know, I, I definitely understand the paleo diet and, um, and, and its benefits. I think the benefits of a high protein diet is, is primarily because you're removing, reducing the carbs, um, rather than increasing the protein, but the, you definitely want to have um, you know, a 25% uh, to 30% intake of protein in your diet. That would, that's, I think, very good. But um, I, I think that, you know, also there's issues of beef with uh, CO2 generation and um, the greenhouse effects and effects on climate that, uh, that I think they're potentially overcomable. But um, I do 
Um, I, I, I'm not a, a major fan of, of red meats because of the potential to increase uric acid and some of these other issues. I, I do um, tend to, to favor fish and poultry. Um, but, you know, I, I, it is not a major area of my research. Um, most of my research is focused on carbohydrates, salt, uh, fat, and things like that. So what are your thoughts, Drew? Tell me. <laughs> well, I think that when you go on Dr. Mark Hyman's podcast, I think you guys will have a fascinating discussion on that on the CO2 side, because he's a lot more of an expert in that world. And I always like to get different people's uh, perspective. Um, me in particular, I've lowered the amount of red meat that I've had over the last few years, primarily because I've seen that saturated fat increases um, an endotoxemic endotoxemia response for people who have challenges with their gut health and leaky gut. So that was happening for me. That doesn't happen for everybody. I think there's a lot of benefits that come, you know, that you can get from especially grass fed, uh, you know, uh, beef that's, that's out there, especially if you're including some high quality organ meats that are there. And I know organ meats are, you know, a little bit of a challenge in your world because they have a high content of, uh, purines is what I've read right. that are out Correct. there. So I think that, I think the big key for me is as I was reading about your research is that if you're eating a lot of these food categories, starting first with fructose, uh, and, and fruit sugars, dehydrated fruit, and then you're having liquid forms of drinking sugar. Then on top of that, you're having uh, a decent amount of alcohol in your diet. That's kind of like the base and, and refined sugars, because even if there's a high amount of glucose, you're converting that glucose to fructose in the body. That's usually the base. That's like a big base of a lot of people's diets is these fruit sugars, refined carbohydrates. Then it doesn't matter what else you're eating. Even if you eat healthy, it's kind of like downhill from there. And even if you think you are eating healthier things, but those things are high in purines like red meat, like sardines and anchovies, potentially organ meats, you may not be getting the beneficial side of those foods if the base of your diet is these refined carbohydrates and liquid forms of sugar. So I think the first thing, like many things, and I think whether somebody's plant-based or not, we were talking about our mutual friend, Dr. Casey Means, who's the chief, chief medical officer at, at Levels. Uh, you know, and you were recently on their podcast, we'll link to that too. You know, uh, she does more plant-based. And I think the thing is that as long as you clean up the base of your diet, a little bit of these foods here and there that you have based that are personalized for you, your body type, your background, your health goals don't seem to be as much of an issue as long as you're getting all the beneficial vegetables that are, that are low glycemic that are in there. Yeah. Actually, you know, when, when it comes to us kind of viewing the overall nutrition pathway, uh, or all the different types of food, I agree with you. Sugar, uh, high glycemic carbs, these are the two major groups that I think are driving, um, you know, obesity. I think that there's some evidence that red meats are not as good as some of these other, like other meats. Uh, I think that uh, there's evidence that salt actually plays a role in obesity. Yeah, talk about um, salt. Uh, you know, I, we, we were going to do a whole deep dive, but just give it top level since we were talking about a few different categories. Um, you know, you have a unique take on salt. Yeah, so it, it turns out that salt, um, you know, when you eat salt, doesn't have any calories. So usually when we think of salt, we think of, oh, you know, we need to restrict it because it can raise blood pressure. And actually it's true, a high salt intake, especially if the kidney isn't able to excrete salt, can increase the risk for high blood pressure. And uh, not in everybody, because uh, you, you have to have, the kidney has to have some issues with, with excreting the salt to really see that rise in blood pressure. But salt, you know, we think of as, has not, we haven't usually thought of it as playing a role in, in fat or obesity or insulin resistance. But when we discovered that the body can make fructose, we, we started looking at what is known, what are the known mechanisms for stimulating fructose production. And one of the things that can do that is if the salt concentration in your blood goes up. And so when you eat salt, your, the salt concentration in the blood initially goes up, that stimulates thirst, and then you drink water to correct that. And so um, 
we knew that that when the salt concentration goes up in the blood, that fructose is made. So it made us realize that a salty diet might actually be a mechanism for generating fructose in the body. And you would, it particularly like if you're eating carbs. So like French fries, the salt in the French fry um, then helps uh, stimulate the conversion of the starch in the potato to fructose. It, it's like a combination hit. You eat the high glycemic carb with salt, and that's going to markedly amplify the ability to make fructose. And so what we did is we, uh, we, gave, we started, first we reviewed the literature, and we found to our surprise that people who are overweight tend to eat a high salt diet, that people who are overweight tend to have a high salt concentration in their blood, that people who are overweight tend to have the presence of a hormone in the blood that's associated with high salt concentration and with dehydration, and that's called vasopressin. And so people who are overweight or obese or have metabolic syndrome tend to be on high salt diets. They tend to be slightly dehydrated because the salt concentration goes up in their blood and they tend to have this. And then there's studies that show that if you have a high salt on a high salt diet, that it actually predicts the, the development of obesity. So we thought, oh my gosh, could salt be an unrecognized cause of obesity? So what we did is we took animals, we put them on a, a salty diet. And, you know, initially the first two months, nothing happened. I mean, it was like they did not really show much difference from the control animals. But beginning around the third month, suddenly they started gaining weight. And by the fourth month, they were these mice were huge. They, they, they were fat and rotund and, um, and they had metabolic syndrome. And when we looked inside, then we found that they were making a lot of fructose from uh, the food they were eating. So even though they weren't eating any sugar, they were making sugar. And then what we did is we did the high salt diet in animals that could not break down fructose and they... They were completely protected. They, they ate the same amount of salt, but they did not get, get overweight. And so we realized that salt was another cause of hypertension. But it was not the, it's, it's not really the salt per se. It's the fact that salt makes the body act like it's dehydrated. It raises the salt concentration. So if we gave salt with water so that the salt concentration in the blood didn't go up, we could block obesity as well. So the, so when you eat salt, when you're eating salty food, you're triggering the production of fructose, just like when your blood glucose goes up with the high glycemic food. So we, we have the glucose monitor that tells us, you know, that, that our glucose levels are high. We're making sugar. We're activating this switch to get fat. But every time we eat salt, there's nothing to tell us until we get thirsty. And at that point, we've actually activated this switch. So when we and so we did a study with people where we gave a salty soup to raise their salt concentration acutely, and when we did that, their blood pressure went up. But if we gave the salty soup with water so that their salt concentration did not go up in their blood, uh, even though they ate the same amount of salt, their blood pressure didn't go up. So it turned out that um, the way salt works is not from the amount. It's, it's, it's if you uh, eat a lot of salt without drinking a lot of water. And, and what happens then is that triggers the, bot, the, the animal, or in this case us, to think we're dehydrated. And that makes us want to put on fat because fat is the source of water for the animal. When you burn fat, you produce water. And that's why animals in the desert have a lot of fat, like the camel, because it it's dehydrated, so it stimulates fat. It wants the fat to provide a source of metabolic water. Um, and so it puts it on its hump so that the fat doesn't spread over the body where it would cause overheating. So, uh, and that's why the whale has so much fat because it doesn't drink seawater. It has to have the fat to make fresh water. And so it, it lives in this salty environment, the sea, and that helps drive the fat production that it then uses to help survive. So it's all part of the survival mechanism. When we eat salt, we're creating that same alarm signal, but it's creating, quote, dehydration instead of starvation. And that's activating the switch as well. So there's two 
major foods that are driving obesity. One is sugar and fructose generation for like from high glycemic carbs. And the other is salt, which creates dehydration. And that also stimulates fructose production and drives, um, that drives fat. And then things like meats and beer, they come in a, also through their ability to stimulate uric acid. They can also do it. So all these foods do it to some extent, which makes it a challenge to figure out um, how to how to block the switch and how to restore health. But it's possible, believe it or not. There's because there are foods that are good and there are foods that are bad, just as you say. Well, you know, one point that I want to make on salt before we go ahead and conclude is that if we look at the vast amount of sodium that's in people's diet in America today, it's coming not through the salt that they add on their own food that they make at home. It's coming from ultra processed foods. So it's the salt in those categories. So just so anybody who's listening, who loves a little bit of the sea salt on their, on their fish or grass fed meats, or adds a little bit of sea salt to their, their salad here and there, largely unless if somebody's really piling on a lot of salt, which in most cases would be unappetizing, you wouldn't want to add that much salt. It's that we've been hijacked. Our taste buds have been hijacked with these ultra processed foods that we eat that have the sodium sort of disguised in. Is that what you've seen through your work? Oh, oh for sure. Like there, you can go, they also like will inject salt water into like shrimp and stuff to make them big and look big. Chicken as well. Yeah, inject- yeah. So you go to the marketplace and you see these shrimp that have been, you know, colored with, there's like a artificial color to make them look good. And there's, they've been injected with salt water to make them look big. And then you go home and you cook them and then they shrivel up. <laughs> they shrivel up. And the salt you cook them. And, and I, but the salt's in there still. And uh, yeah, no, this is a real problem. Processed foods is a major source of salt and also a major source of, uh, of sugar. Uh, it's often in the processed foods as well. Now, if we're mostly cooking at home and we're eating a whole foods diet, which is really the solution around a lot of this, and we're avoiding the refined carbs, we're f- avoiding the refined sugars and the concentrated sugars that we talked about earlier, which naturally means that we're most likely going to be avoiding the the high concentration salts because we're not eating those foods as the base of our diet. A little bit here and there, people can eat whatever they want, but as the base, the base means what is 90, 95% of what you eat on a daily basis. Is there what you would recommend as a upper limit of how much sodium somebody would have in a, in a, in a day? So it depends on your exercise level and how much like you're sweating and your, your, your balance. Now the average person, I think, uh, you know, four to five grams of salt a day is, is probably the right uh, number, but, um, you know, it just depends if you're a person who likes to exercise and I recommend exercise, you know, and you're sweating a lot, you're going to have to probably eat more salt than if you, uh, are, are, don't exercise. And, and the, one of the tricks is to make sure you drink plenty of water. Um, our, cool. our work clearly shows that the very powerful effect of hydration, drinking water, it can help reduce the risk for obesity and, and diabetes um, and keeping, you know, preventing yourself from getting dehydrated and activating the switch um, is really important. Uh, if you're going to eat salty food, drink water uh, during while you're eating the food and, and try not to get to the point where you get thirsty, because once you get thirsty, you've kind of activated the switch. And um, I, th- I think that every meal should begin with a glass of water in front of you and you drink that water first and then you eat. And we should probably be drinking a glass of water between meals as well. Um, I think water is an under understated uh, uh, and incredibly important way to, to stay healthy and to keep to to uh, to help reduce obesity um, and uh, diabetes and all of those things that we want to avoid. Tell us about what you found. You and a team are proposing a new hypothesis about Alzheimer's and its relationship to something called fructose. So yeah. tell us what it is. Well, so the, the cause of Alzheimer's has been a big mystery for a, a very, very long time. And, and, uh, and there have been di- different hypotheses that have been brought up. But we, uh, we have a hypothesis that we think is, is actually fairly strong at trying to explain the cause of this disease. 
Um, so, you know, Alzheimer's, you know, the physician Alzheimer described these patients that developed dementia. And he uh, then at autopsy, he showed that they had characteristic lesions in their brain, uh, one being amyloid plaques, which are these kind of protein uh, amalgam of protein proteinaceous material that is uh, in the in the brain itself around the neurons and also uh, kind, of, kind of like we have plaque on the teeth yeah people think of plaque in the arteries <laughs> exactly there's actually some plaque in the brain right so it, it he uh, observed these amyloid plaques and the, these things that he called neurofibrillary tangles which turned out to be an accumulation of an unusual protein called tau and uh and so this became the characteristic finding for uh, deme uh for alzheimer's dementia it was a uh, disease associated with amyloid plaques, tau protein, and kind of a shrunken brain. And the, the question is, what caused that? Right. And, and for and just to interject here, for years, we've spent billions and billions and billions of dollars coming up with different therapeutics right. that are trying to address that plaque. And so far, it's been unsuccessful. Right. I mean, there are a couple of treatments out there that do kind of remove some of the amyloid plaque, but they're not particularly that successful, you know, they don't really cure the disease. And, uh, and, and so they may provide a little bit benefit, but uh, everyone's searching for something more. So uh, our hypothesis kind of explains the story of Alzheimer's pretty much from the beginning until the end. And so, uh, no, I don't think there have been too many hypotheses that have actually shown how it can be initiated and how it can drive the whole course of the disease. And the important thing is it's, it looks like it's a preventable disease. It looks like it's driven by certain types of diets. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you about it today. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited. And before we go into it, you know, one thing that's also really tricky and it's kind of very similar to the conversation around obesity that's there today. Right. Right. Um, there are, so many different camps and one of the biggest camps that's out there is arguing that obesity you hear it sometimes on the news on places like 60 minutes oh it's a genetic thing right and if we can only come up with the right drug you know something like ozempic then we can get to the root issue but any grade school student can take a step back even if there's a place for these drugs and can say huh this is a little weird just a hundred years ago obesity rates weren't at the level that they are right now. And in a similar way, we could apply that same level of thinking to Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. So, you know, so there has been this, uh, when, when Alzheimer came out and, and reported these cases between about 1910 and 1950, there was like only 30 or 40 cases published. You know, I mean, that's hardly any. Uh, one of the problems were that uh, they, no one was really uh, reporting autopsies of people who are very old, what they called senile dementia. And now we know that senile dementia is frequently Alzheimer's. So there could have been a lot more cases uh, way back when. But, but, the, but the data suggests that Alzheimer's really is increasing dramatically over the last several decades, not just because we're living longer, but because if, even if you do uh, you know, look at people who are 65, the, the number of people, the percentage of people with Alzheimer's is increasing at each age, uh, at each year. So th there does seem to be a real increase in Alzheimer's in the last few years. And it's hard to say genetics could drive that when you see this significant rise. Alzheimer's now like the sixth most common cause of death. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a devastating disease, both for the patient and for the family. So trying to figure out the cause is really important. Yeah. And so we know it's not genetics, or it's probably most likely not the primary driver because we've seen this explosion we also know it's not diagnosis by itself right sometimes people are like oh well medicine is advancing so much we just get be we're getting better at finding these things which also coincides with the fact that people are living longer but as you mentioned that's not the case and i think i've seen saw a news report like a month or two ago that even people in their like mid 50s like some of the first cases of alzheimer's you're starting to see with individuals at that age, which is very scary. It could even yeah. be younger than that. Yeah. Do you know of people anybody any younger than that? Uh no, that's that's pretty young. But um, yeah, there are cases that occur earlier than that. But in general, you know, it's uh it's usually in the sixties and seventies that Alzheimer's will you know, some of the earlier cases are like in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. Totally. And so 
this all leads to the place of what has happened that either our environment has changed significantly or something is going on. So let's now talk about your hypothesis with some of the authors that uh, you co-wrote this paper in. And so remind us, what was the name of the journal that this was uh, published in? It was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And uh, I have to begin by saying, I'm not a neurologist, but I've been studying obesity and sugar and diet uh, for many years. So it was really important for me when we were kind of looking at this hypothesis to you, to uh, communicate it to neurologists, people who are expert uh, on Alzheimer's so that I could, and, and, you know, uh, tell them about the hypothesis, discuss it with them, work with them on it. And, and so I was very lucky that David Perlmutter uh, and Dale Bredesen, who are two fantastic neurologists, uh, uh, you know, joined me on this hypothesis, as well as some other people like Maria Nagel, who's a expert on Alzheimer's disease and is based at the University of Colorado. So Drew, whenever you come up with an idea, it's always wise to find experts to, to, to work with, you know, in that area so that, uh, so that, you know, your, it strengthens your hypothesis, you get feedback, they can help, they can fill in the gaps and it, you end up with a stronger story. So yeah, absolutely. That was my and, case. and for those that are watching on YouTube, you know, most are listening on audio, but if you are watching on YouTube, we have a link to the uh, press summary that's here, as well as uh, Tessa, if you can click over to the uh, overview page on uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, right? This is the one where yeah, it was that's published. It. That's so it. You can see the authors that are inside there. And of course, if you have access to these journals, you can read the full one. But in general, uh, you know, most people probably don't have access, but at least you can see the summary page that's there. Yeah. So how did you come up with the idea of what your hypothesis is based around and how did you what how did you come up with it what does it say and how did you work with the people that you published this with including some individuals who you've mentioned who have been on this podcast Dr. David Perlmutter uh Dr. Dale Bredesen uh to stress test the idea to make sure that it was yes. robust enough to put out there to the community. Absolutely. So uh, let's begin, you know, where I started was by reading about Alzheimer's <laughs> because obviously, you know, uh, it's such an important disease. It's a disease that has been, we believe it has been increasing in the last century. And, you know, uh, I, the studies that I have been doing have been on things like obesity and diabetes. So, <clears throat> So just to, to talk about Alzheimer's just for a few minutes, we talked about the focus being on amyloid plaques and tau protein. And you know, in the very beginning, everyone said, well, maybe that's the cause of Alzheimer's, these plaques. And if we can figure out how to, to remove the plaques or to prevent the plaques, we can treat the disease. And so much of the focus of the pharma, big pharma has been to try to develop ways to block that. And as you have already mentioned, you know, there's been like 40 different drugs that have gone to trial and only a few have succeeded and they only work partially at best. Um, and so people said, you know, there must be something that starts this, this whole disease. Let's, you know, let's go back to when the disease is just beginning. Can we actually identify, uh, you know, factors that seem to be important? And some of the factors that were important, were, you know, it's associated with diabetes and obesity, and these are diseases that I study. So I was interested in that. And it's also associated with insulin resistance in the brain. And they do these studies where they can show that there's an impairment of glucose uh, being taken up in the brain. If you do special scans, you can show that, uh, that there's an impairment in the ability for the brain to take up glucose. It's like the glu it's like the brain is becoming insulin resistant. And and if you wouldn't mind, we've done so many episodes on metabolic health, insulin resistance, why it's important to be insulin sensitive, but just give a little recap in the context, just in case somebody's watching this for the first time and they may not understand, like, well, what does it mean to be insulin resistant inside of the brain? Okay, so so you know, the brain uh, uses glucose as its primary fuel and it loves glucose. Glucose is the main carbohydrate that's uh, circulating in our blood. If our glucose levels are high, we, we call it diabetes. If the glucose levels are low, we call it hypoglycemia. 
but glucose is like the primary fuel and it's a major fuel the brain uses. And, um, but in early Alzheimer's, um, there seems to be an impairment in the neurons being able to utilize the glucose. There's like, uh, it, you know, so insulin is a hormone that takes, that helps drive glucose into cells. And if you become insulin resistant, you have trouble getting glucose into the into those cells. Most of, a lot of the brain it doesn't require much insulin at all and glucose can go in pretty easily. But there's certain regions of the brain that are insulin sensitive. And those parts of the brain, if you become insulin resistant, you can't deliver the fuel as well. And that's associated with the second problem that you see in Alzheimer's, which is the, the mitochondria are these little factories in the cell that make energy, they make ATP. And uh, they, there seems to be some uh, problems with these energy factories in early Alzheimer's. They're not making as much ATP as they should. There uh, seems to be some stress going on with the mitochondria over time. There can be a loss of mitochondria. And so you have a problem with the energy factories. You have a problem with the, the, them taking up glucose to make energy and you have low grade inflammation. And I thought to myself, you know, this is actually what I study, but not in the brain, but what I'm studying in the circulation, what I'm studying in the systemic systems. You know, I, I'm looking at what drives insulin resistance, and I have personally linked it with energy production and inability to for the these energy factories to make ATP. And I thought, oh my gosh, there's a connection there. And you know, they were even, you know, some people call early Alzheimer's brain diabetes because of this insulin resistance, you know? And so I knew that there had to be some kind of link between those two diseases, you know, uh, between obesity and diabetes. And, uh, and, and people who are obese and diabetic have an increased risk for developing it. But there seemed to, it, what, it isn't a match, you know? It isn't like if you're overweight, you're gonna get, to, <laughs> you're gonna get dementia. But, but there is this uh, association. So, a strong correlation. Yeah, a correlation. Yeah. And, and so I started thinking about you know, what, what our work shows in, in the body. And I started thinking about how that system might work on the brain. And I, and I had this kind of, Oh, aha moment mm. where I suddenly realized that I could explain how Alzheimer's develops. And so, um, that's uh, you know, it's a, it's a hypothesis. So everybody who's looking at me, <laughs> please, please don't, you know, it's not like I'm saying this is the cause, but what I would like to present you the evidence because it's very strong. Right. And one of the individuals, before we get to it, and this buildup is great because it's not just that we're trying to tease people before we get into it. We're actually trying to give you background knowledge of how you are showing your homework of how you arrived to this hypothesis right. because everything in science starts off as a hypothesis. Exactly. Right? And it's important for the audience to understand how you got there because even if the hypothesis is not 100% exactly true in the way that it's being presented, there are many instances where it could still be a big factor, the thing that we're going to get into that you think is deeply linked into, you know, that connection with Alzheimer's. And then with a lot of lifestyle and lifestyle factors and diet factors, there's things that we can do now where we could essentially play a little bit of a precautionary role in our life, right? Yes. If we find out that a food or an ingredient or a particular behavior that there's not a hundred percent consensus consensus about its link to a disease like Alzheimer's, but there does seem to be some strong links. We can say, okay, what are the pros and cons? Should we lower this ingredient in our life? Right? Yes. Uh, should right. we maintain the amount that we're eating right now? Should we at least take a precautionary approach because the argument is so strong and the downside is we might even get healthier. Yes, you know, if you If you follow some of the advice in this <laughs> podcast and yeah. what you're presenting inside of the paper with Dale Bredesen and, and David Perlmutter, you know, the downside, knock on wood, is that people are just going to get healthier. The upside is that we actually could potentially lower our risk of developing Alzheimer's. Yes. And I want to say one more thing. You know, the analogy that you gave about what's going on in the brain is very powerful. You know, not only is the fuel to the power plant being disrupted but the power plant itself is not working as efficiently. That's the mitochondria. Right. And on top of that, there's a fire 
at the power plant, which is this low grade inflammation. So all these things are going on in the brain. It's going to be a recipe for disaster. And that's what exactly. you're painting out is going on for people as they're on their path and their way to Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, just like currently, uh, you know, people, are, there are different groups that are saying, okay, they've got insulin resistance in the brain. How about if we give insulin through the nose, through the nostrils, where it can actually get to the brain directly? And can we treat the disease? Can we improve things? And there are early studies saying that might help a little bit. And there are people giving anti-inflammatories that can block the inflammation in the brain. They're seeing some, a little bit of protection. But the problem, Drew, with all these kinds of problems, of these approaches is they're trying to patch, they're trying to put out the fire, but they're not trying to figure out what's causing the fire. Yeah. And um, what's fantastic about this story that I'm gonna share with you is that it. There, I'm gonna try to show you how it happens and how we can prevent it. And at the, you know, at, at the end, let's talk about all the ways and the evidence that, that we can actually uh, re reverse or block early Alzheimer's and, and so forth. Because it's a very exciting area. No, it's super exciting. And uh, so let's get into it. How do you want to yeah. start with the story? You know, you've been on the podcast previously. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have your book in front of you here, your yeah. last book that you wrote. It's called Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. And there's a little bit of a link yes. that's there because it goes back to your work into sort of our origin as humans and how certain adaptations that we had in our genetics to potentially uh, uh, adapt to the climate that was changing rapidly around us. Um, those adaptations helped us survive, but the byproduct is that those adaptations in our modern life, now that we're eating so much processed foods, those adaptations are being hijacked and they're causing us to be fat. You're absolutely right. So there, we, we have identified two mutations that have occurred in the past, both kind of interesting stories that make us more susceptible to obesity and diabetes, and at the same time, may also have a role in increasing our risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and, and, but the, the fundamental issue is, is not just those mutations, but what is this pathway that's causing obesity and diabetes? So what I'd love to do is to take you through that part and Let's then we can then hit the, you know, the mutations and these, you know, the survival pathway in the past as well. For sure. So it's an, it's an important part of the story and it builds up and they're both linked yes, together. This yeah, is kind of like the culmination together. of your work. So I was very interested in, in uh, what was causing obesity and diabetes. And, um, and through a series of adventures and research, uh, adventures related to doing different studies, we came to the, to the observation that uric acid was uh, very important in obesity and diabetes. And uric acid um, is a substance that circulates in our blood um, and uh, it's like a breakdown product of energy. So when energy breaks down, uh, energy is, we call energy ATP. Uh, and that's the, the what we use uh, to do everything we want. So the mitochondria, these energy factories produce ATP and the ATP is what gives us the energy. There's really two types of energy. There's the active energy, which is the ATP. That's for, you know, talking, running, jumping, and then there is stored energy and stored energy is fat and, you know, can be carbohydrates too, but most of stored energy is fat. And so when a bear is hibernating and he's not eating and not getting the energy from food, he can use the stored energy or fat to produce the ATP he needs. So yeah, fat is a battery pack yes. that nature designed us to have. We think of it as being bad in modern times, but it was crucial in our survival because it meant energy. That's right. So uh, I became interested because we found that uric acid had a role in causing fat and it had a role in raising blood pressure and causing things. So, you, you know, as I mentioned, uric acid is a substance circulating in our blood and it varies. And a lot of people have low levels and some people have very high levels of uric acid. And if the levels get really high, um, that can cause a disease called gout. And which gout, a lot of people are familiar yeah, with as nine it's related people, to right. uric acid. That's yeah. how most people know about it. They That's might know right. that their parent or grandparent or somebody, you know, their uric acid levels were so high that they were like, oh, you're dealing with gout yeah. or that individual. Typically, what are the symptoms associated with gout? You know, people often hear yeah, about- Yeah, they get this joint pain. It's basically an inflammation of the joints. And so you get this red hot 
joint, you typically the big toe or the knee or the ankle, sometimes the wrist. And it's miserable. Uh, you know, it's very, very painful. It lasts a couple of weeks. Sometimes, uh, you know, you people take medication like uh, Advil and ibuprofen can help reduce the inflammation. Um, but it's, you know, it, although people used to think of gout as just being an arthritis, there's more and more evidence that it's not. And these uric acid crystals can also go to the kidneys and go to the blood vessels. And about there's recent studies that suggest that people with gout, that, you know, that they have crystals in their aorta and their coronary arteries too, you know, uh, uh, the majority have some crystals in their blood vessels. It tends to go to the plaques uh, in the in the blood vessels. Mm. And so, um, so, so gout is not just an arthritis and, and it's been known for a long time that gout is also associated with obesity and diabetes and um, and hypertension and and kidney disease and so uh, I which had, is also why for sorry to interrupt yeah. for a long time people would call it the rich man's disease exactly right? because it was associated with excess and especially in our you know society you know 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago where an obesity rates were a lot lower they did see gout primarily in individuals that had access to extra calories yes which also included alcohol. alcohol. And that's why they sweet would typically wines. sweet wines, things like that. They would typically that's right, you know, tell those individuals to avoid those types of foods if they were dealing with gout. So anyway, so f for a long time, people, uh, you know, linked gout with you know being a rich man's disease, also with being o overweight, obese, hypertensive, all these conditions. Uh, it's about uh, seventy percent of people with gout are overweight. I mean, it's like a very strong association. Sixty or seventy percent are. Are, are diabetic. I mean, it's a, a very strong link. And people were saying for years, thought, you know, um, hypertension and diabetes and obesity increase your risk for, for gout. But actually, the high uric acid usually precedes the development of obesity. It precedes the development of diabetes. It precedes the development of kidney disease. It's one of the earliest markers that predicts the development of these conditions. It's a very strong predictor. And uh, when we were studying it, we realized that uric acid doesn't just form crystals and cause inflammation. Uric acid is biologically active. And one of its main things that it does is it in, acts on mitochondria, those little energy factories, and it causes stress to them and reduces their energy production. Mm. Think about that. Okay. So anyway, so I was studying uric acid and that took me to uh, you know, what, uh, we had this evidence that it was driving blood pressure, uh, and might have a cause in hypertension. And, uh, and we did this study actually in adolescents who are overweight, where we lowered uric acid in them and their blood pressure corrected it. And we published it in the JAMA. It was, you know, a big deal. And that was done through medical intervention? Um, yeah. It was, we just, low, yeah, we used the drug to lower the uric acid and a ninety percent of them or so became normal tensive. It, wow. it was it was uh, amazing. And, and by the they way, they that, never got they never received a blood pressure pill. And that's your area of expertise, right? Right. That's your background, right. As a kidney doctor, that's right. That's, that's really your bread and butter of what you yes. studied in your in your career. So then the question was, what drives the uric acid up? And you know, most people think of alcohol and actually things like red meats, but actually one of the major things that raises uric acid is fructose and sugar. And uh, and so actually Gary Tovs, uh, who I'm sure you know, uh, was, interviewed me related to a paper that came, that uh, was published in the New England Journal on, on gout and its relationship with, uh, you know, with diet. And uh, when we were talking on the phone, he says, well, what do you think about sugar as a driver of of uric acid and i said well it's definitely is a driver it's the fructose component uh and then uh you know and and you know after i had my conversation with him i went home and i thought you know uh we should give fructose to animals and see uh, if they develop high blood pressure and if we lower the uric acid can we lower the blood pressure because at this point i was focused on blood pressure and so what happened was uh you know, uh, some people in my lab, Taka Nakagawa, we gave fructose to animals and they became hypertensive. 
Uh, and so fructose is that component of sugar. So table sugar or sucrose um, has is half fructose and half glucose. And there's another sweetener, high fructose corn syrup. It's also about half and half fructose and glucose. But fructose is the only sugar that raises uric acid. Mm. And so we gave fructose to animals and they became hypertensive. The we, blood pressure was high. Yeah, the blood pressure went up just like this. And we gave the drug to lower the uric acid and the blood pressure came down. But there was a big surprise because the animals that got fructose also started getting fat and they started developing insulin resistance. And they, you know, they, their uh, fats went up in their blood, the fat went up in their liver. I mean, they were developing obesity and metabolic syndrome right in front of us. And when we lowered the uric acid, we actually could reduce all of those. And I go, oh, it can't be. It can't be just lowering the blood pressure, and all, but also lowering all these other things. And then we started realizing this was that fructose was, first off, it was a very potent driver of obesity. But the other thing is we could lessen it by lowering uric acid. And the cool part is uric acid's not in the caloric pathway, you know, so there's calories, you know, everyone says it's calories, but calories are the, yes, say everything. the calories are the big driver of obesity. Right. But uric acid was being produced independently of the of calories. calories. And when we block that part, we actually were blocking, uh, you know, the, the obesity. And, and w then we said, well, what's driving it? And we started doing a million studies. And what we realized is that fructose actually makes animals obese by, uh, affecting their appetite. Basically it induces, um, it blocks the ability to, uh, to feel full. And so animals will keep eating, uh, you know, a lot. I mean, they eventually stop eating, but they eat a lot more than they're supposed to. And, and it turns out that they become resistant to a harm, hormone called leptin. And when they become leptin resistant, they can, they'll eat and eat. Now, if you give them just fructose, they don't gain that much weight because the fructose is only four calories per gram. High, you know, fat is nine calories per gram. So if you give, if you make them so they're hungry and then you give them that fatty food, then they if get they have fat. access yeah, to other yeah, sources of other, concentrated yeah. calories. Right. Then they get super fat. So the fat, we could show that the fat was really important for the weight gain. But if you just gave the animal fat, they didn't gain as much weight. It was much, much less. They ate the food. They felt the signal of leptin, which said I'm full yeah. or I'm not they, as hungry. And so they didn't overeat. But if they had fructose, that's they right. couldn't sense that signal that's leptin. Right. And so they kept on eating if they in right. particular had access yes. to highly concentrated calories in the form of fat. Yeah. And we even did an experiment where we gave fructose to make them leptin resistant. And then we stopped the fructose and they stay left in resistance for several weeks, like two or three weeks. And then if you put them on a high fat diet, they gain a lot more weight with a high fat diet than they would with just a regular high fat diet. So the, so the leptin resistance could carry over. So if you st stop the sugar and you think that you're, you're good, for at least a couple of weeks, you can stay leptin resistant. Got it. So there's a little bit of time that it took. Yeah, both before it went away. Both for animals, but probably as you're theorizing for human beings too, right. that if you are used to, and your body's used to eating a lot of fructose, we'll talk about the top sources of fructose yeah. in a second in our modern diet, then you could end up in a place and a position where even if you pull back from those foods, you still have the urge to overeat. Right. And then what we did is we studied this. We found that the way fructose works is uh, it's unique from all other calories, from all other foods. It's the only food that drops the ATP in the cell. Mm. And it's and the way it works is how you can say, well, how does if Which you're giving if production. you're giving if you're giving fructose, the calories should increase the ATP. You would say, except remember, there's two sources of energy. There's two energies. There's the ATP, which is the active energy. And then there's the stored energy. Together, they equal the total energy. Mm. So when you eat, normally when you eat calories, you know, you try to keep your ATP levels high. You want the gas tank full. You don't want the ATP level to fall. If it does, it's like an alarm signal, you know, gas tank, you know, you, you know, running on empty, running on empty, close to empty. 
So normally we try to keep our ATP full and then if there's extra energy, it goes into the fat. The fat is kind of the backup. It's like the, the luggage, you know, but you want that, the, the, the gas tank full. What fructose does is it lowers the ATP level by, block, by acting on the mitochondria. It reduces the, it stuns the mitochondria so they don't make as much ATP. It's almost like a little bit of poison for the yes, mitochondria. It, it, yeah, it does. It's, it's oxidative stress to the mitochondria. It, and it's very specific and it knocks out different aspects of it. And the result is that there's less ATP in the cell and instead the energy gets shunted to the fat. Energy balance is maintained. You know, if you're eating energy, you know, calories are a type of energy. You, you, it will, you, you will either burn it or, or store it and it gets stored here. But you, you keep the ATP levels low. So what happens is the body thinks it's starving. Mm. It's so, because it feels like there's not enough energy. So you keep eating. And then eventually the ATP levels recover when you, so when you have a soft drink, you know, there's this, there's this uh, period of time where the ATP level falls. You can measure it by using special NMR and things like that. You can actually measure the ATP like in your liver after drinking a soft drink and it plummets. A traditional soft drink, one of the big brands that yes, is yes. sweetened with high yes, fructose yes, corn syrup. Yes, high fructose corn syrup for sugar. And, and, and so it's the fructose that does it. So when we started studying this, we go, oh my gosh, uh, obesity is also a low energy state. If you biopsy the liver or the muscle, the ATP levels are low. And if you biopsy, uh, you know, the uh, in diabetes, if you, if you, you know, look at the tissues, the ATP levels are low. All these are low energy states and yet everybody's eating more. Right. They're having so many calories. Yes. So you're thinking, why is this person? Their in a total low energy is energy. high because it's all stored. It's fat. all being stored and something signaling to the body. Right. Don't use this energy, but actually store this energy. And that goes back to this idea of uric acid and yes. fructose yes. being a poison to the mitochondria. Yes. And, you know, and so it turns out that, you know, a lot of people were thinking of obesity as you cap off the tank and the extra goes into fat. But actually the trick is to drop the ATP to make you eat more and to shunt the energy to fat. So zooming out for just a second here to provide it in context, because we've had all sorts of different people on the podcast before that our audience has heard from. Some people in the traditional energy balance world, which is really all about calories in and calories out. If we want people to lose weight, we just need to lower their total calories, right? And there is a lot of truth to that. There yes. is energy balance inside of the body. Yes, right? this is still an energy balance There's equation. still an energy balance component. And yes, if you do, you know, if you're eating excess calories than what your body can handle, then you're going to end up gaining weight that's there. Now, another side of it, is the side that says, look, calories are important, but they're not the only thing. There's other pathways that are at play. And you're describing one of the pathways that we know is established in animals. Yes. Is it established in humans as well? I think so. So so let's just go through this again. So, so like the energy balance people say that it's mainly fat is the main thing that's driving weight gain. And, you know, if because you do, it because it's the highest density of calories. Right. And if you're going to do a short-term study and you do carb restriction or fat restriction, you might actually lose more weight by doing fat restriction. And the low carb people say, wait a second, if you go on a low carb diet, you, you don't even have to, you know, you're, you're, uh, you don't even have to restrict calories. You're going to lose weight. Right. And it's just, and, and the both are right. They're both and, right. And it turns, and I actually, I've submitted a paper, it's under review, that unites all these different hypotheses because this work that I'm talking about actually does unite these pathways. So for example, if you go on a low carb diet, after a couple of weeks, you're gonna become leptin sensitive. And, and so you're gonna really control, you know, you're gonna, uh, you, you're not gonna be gaining weight despite being on a high fat diet. So a low carb diet is often high fat, yet you're not gaining weight. That This doesn't match with the energy balance people who say, well, if you go on a high fat diet, you should really gain weight because it's got the most calories. And one clarification about that. 
some t- sometimes the energy balance folks say, well, you're still eating less calories. And then the people on the other side say there's two different camps. There's one camp that says, well, calories don't matter. You can even be eating a lot more calories and not gain as much weight. And then there's the other side that says, well, you just don't crave as much calories, right? So yeah. you're not, cause you're, you're more likely to connect in because you're leptin sensitive. You're like, okay, I got it. My brain got it. I'm full. I don't need to eat anymore. That's, yes. That, that's the key. So that's the key. you become leptin sensitive when you go on a low carb diet. So you, you're going to fill up much quicker. You, 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 and if you're leptin resistant, you're going to keep eating a lot. But what drives calories, you know, is really, it's the, the fatty foods have a lot more calories. So it's really easy to gain weight uh, if you are leptin resistant, you know, with, with high, f- with fatty foods. So, especially so like, in our world of ultra yes, processed foods, yes, yes, where you have the perfect combination of yes. often, you know, high carb, high fat, yes, yes, sugar, salty, it's all the things together, makes it super easy for people to gain weight. So what we what we did is we gave fructose and we could make animals obese. They developed all features of metabolic syndrome, you know, insulin resistance and all these things. And we realized it was a survival system for them because uh, they're, they're, they're thinking that, you know, that they're in a low energy state so storing fat will help them. You know, it's it's like what the bear does before it hibernates. It will eat all this f- huge amounts of fruit, which has fructose, to help increase their fat stores so that they can make it through winter. They become insulin resistant so that the blood levels of glucose are high, so that those areas of the brain that are not insulin sensitive can can get fuel, uh, preferentially over the muscle where the muscle insulin resistance in the muscle reduces the glucose uptake in the muscle. So when you're insulin resistant, uh, what happens is the muscle becomes resistant to the effects of insulin in particular, and they use less glucose. So the glucose levels go up in the brain and there's more glucose for the brain. So it actually, you know, if you're starving, you want your brain to get the fuel more than anywhere else. So so insulin resistance can be a benefit to the brain acutely because it, it re- removes the glucose from going into the muscle to rather to to be provided for the brain for those areas of the brain that don't require insulin. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. What's cool is that science is bringing us really to the cutting edge, that forefront, where we begin to understand why the things that taste so great are actually so great.